touched about we understand what freedom is. We understand what citizenship is. We understand what justice is because we are the the, the ideologue, so to speak, right, of of those concepts. And so to me, how how do how do we have a conversation about justice, about freedom, about equity without history? I don't think we can have a real conversation without it, because the answers to the to those questions are in the historical archives, are in, you know, these oral histories, are in, you know, yearbooks and, and things that's in your grandparents attics or, 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 you know, you know, buildings that 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 old black teacher organizations uh, talked about. And so th that's my joy. And I, and, and I, I do think I've always found that that joy, the joy is in the clarity. And, 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 and I look forward again to continuing this conversation not only today, but also, you know, at, you know, throughout the year, you know, just because that's where we find our answers. And so um, I think to answer the question, that's that's really what drove me to uh, the work that we the work that I do and the work that I continue to do. So all of you have talked about this idea of being disconnected or being connected, depending on how you look at it. And so I, one of the things I think we're dealing with in our world when it comes to this idea of history is not only may we are we not connected to it, uh, but in some ways it's also being revised for us. Um, and and then that history, that revised history, is then being presented to to people, and I would say children as well in schools, but being presented to people as as the truth. And so I, I I wonder what your idea is about in terms of how do we begin to create a history that's authentic, that's rooted in justice, that's rooted in freedom that's rooted in the reality of our shared history, because at the end of the day, this is a shared history. Um, what does that process look like for beginning to change the way that we think about history, but also change the way that we tell the story? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I am blessed to be the father of a six-year-old who is in the virtual first grade. So I am back in the virtual first grade. Uh, and um, my, my son, it, it's interesting in watching him develop because on one level, he's my child. He's a six-year-old, he's innocent, you know, he's loving, uh, he enjoys school. But then on the flip side, you know, one day I'm gonna have to have the conversation with him about how, you know, Education has oftentimes been something that has marginalized black and brown children, uh, the LGBTQIA community. Like it, it, it hasn't always worked in ways of benefiting folk. And so, with that being said, one of the things that I do with him, and and he doesn't understand it like this, but this is what we do: is before COVID, I would take him into the archive with me, and I would show him things. Uh, there's a uh, Auburn Avenue Research Library has a really great collection in terms of um, the Olympification of Atlanta, as I call it in my research, that looks at how children are seeing uh, how the Olympics is changing Atlanta and they're 10 years old. And so this is in like 1995. And so now they're 35 years old. And to kind of, and I was just, just showing him that. And he was like, daddy, are they talking about the playground that I play, with, play on in, in Woodruff Park? What we have to do, what I'm saying is what we have to do is instead of giving these students this kind of rote narrative that is not good for us, it doesn't include all of us, we have to take our children in the archive. We have to teach them about public history in terms of markers. We have to have them go and talk to the people in the community to give them the stories that then we have to triangulate that to produce, to produce new knowledges. And it, it's not rocket science, but what we have to do is we have to listen to the people. We have to breathe air. We have to, we have to feel the soil. And then we have to try to remember, we have to capture that spirit and remember. Love. <laughs> uh, we so already I'm, got the order now. Don't act like we already got this order. We, okay, you're you right, you're right. I'm, <laughs> my fault, my fault, my fault, my fault. Get it lot. get it lot. So, you know, I think, I know Brian, you, you you try really hard, and she's another scholar that is amazingly busy, that has so many commitments to the community and does amazing work, and that is Georgia State's own Goldie Muhammad. Yes, I tried. Try, I know, <laughs> but yeah, you know, listen, Goldie is out here doing the work, 
He is, he is. And so when we think about curriculum, we first and foremost have to think about the work of Goldie Muhammad. Her book, her book Cultivating Genius, is amazing. And what she does in this book is, is takes us on a path of what, again, remembering what we used to do. Like we, we have to stop thinking that educating black children, as Vanessa Sutter Walker told us, to their highest potential is this new thing that starts with, at 2000 with no child left behind. Our greatest minds were educated in a shack, learned about themselves. We had teachers who were teaching grades one through nine in a shack, and we were teaching excellence. Criticality, as Goldie would say, skills. Like I'm doing my best little Goldie Muhammad right here. Skills and criticality. And so we have to remember who we are. The idea that teaching black children how to love themselves, how to know their history, how to have rigor and critical thinking. We did this with less. But we did it with a commitment to the community. We saw ourselves tied to those children. We saw our children tied to those children. We had teachers that saw that my success was connected to their success. My child's life was connected to their life. They were my children in a particular type of way because they were mine. You know, what? one of my favorite quotes comes from the book, Joan Morgan's book, When Chicken Heads Come, Come Home to Roost. And she talks about the difference between when white women approach black men and when when black women approach black men and she says you know we are the only that call each other brother and sisters we have what a brother that, that's a we all we all them i don't know you from a can of paint but when i see you i give you a head now what up brother that is a connection that we have and we used to teach in that connection right and so we have to start going back and this is why remembering and community is so important we have done these things but we have lost our way as educators, and particularly we have lost our way as black educators. And we have to, and that for me, why abolition is so important, because abolition is always saying we don't need the state. And the state has done harm to our babies. And so when we think about curriculum, we have to think about the thing that we must remove the most is the state. The state mandates, the state curriculum, the state uh, um, standards, all these things are so watered down, low level, basic, and can never see the, even the capacity of what our children have. But what we have sold Black parents and all parents really over the last 40 years of educational reform that these tests show how smart your children are. They don't. They don't. They don't show them to think. You know, you, I, I, I teach, many of us, we teach at universities where these kids are coming in with a grade point averages of 4.7. Like, how do you get a 4.7? Where they come? How do you get a, I thought you only had, a, where did they get 4 point? I mean, it's crazy. Freshman, you know, the university of so-and-so freshman class average GPA is a 4.5. And when you get these kids, you say, well, they can't think. Have never been challenged. And you ask them one hard question that challenges their thinking, they begin to cry. But you got a 4.5. And so we have to remember that these curriculum, these standards, these tests are watered down. They don't show the true intellect of any children and particularly black children. And so we as parents and as community have to be pushing for higher standards and have to be pushing for rigorous standards. But we also have to be pushing for these same standards that include Black excellence, Black joy, Black history, Black criticality, and bring in the historians, bring in the African-American Studies Department. Every single school district should be connected to the African-American Studies Department in their city, every school district. I don't understand why you got the best minds and the best historians in these African American studies department. You got a ton of teachers that don't know anything about black folks. Where's the connection? You got schools of education that are telling these jokers that they are culturally relevant. I'm not taking a class on black people. Don't know anything about us. And you talk about you culturally relevant. How are you culturally relevant? <laughs> 
you can call it culturally relevant, culturally sustaining. You can you stop putting culture in front of stuff. That you, it doesn't mean anything. And so we we in education, the folks who say we certify teachers, we got to get serious about really actually doing this work. And understand that we are are creating very damaging and violent spaces when the majority of white when the majority of educators are white giving them books and theories that tell them that they are culturally relevant without doing any work in the community, any work studying culture, and don't even like black children. Mm-hmm. So we, we can't fix the curriculum because you can give somebody a glorious curriculum. If they don't like you, the curriculum doesn't do anything. So we, we really got to get serious about who we get, who we let, who we certify to be in front of our children. So I want to read from the chat. I don't know if you all are seeing this from the chat. We got comments in the chat. Uh, So Jasmine Houston says, exactly. That reminds me of the quote. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll live its whole life believing it's stupid. (laughs) Absolutely. And then, of course, lots and lots of love uh, for Dr. Goldie Muhammad. And her work, and I'd encourage you to uh, to check out her book, Cultivating Genius. Uh, Vincent, how about it? Yeah, so Dr. Hobson and, and Dr. Love, of course, have, have done the heavy lifting, but but I so I just want to add, you know, a quick thing to it. So it's not a coincidence that Dr. Love is connected to a Dr. Hilliard. It's not a coincidence that Dr. Hobson is connected to a Dr. James Adams. It's not a coincidence that I'm connected to a Dr. Sid Walker. And what I mean by that, to add to Dr. Love's, Dr. Hobson's point, to answer your question directly, Brian. There has to be an intentionality to all of this stuff, right? And intentionality we know can be good, which is what we're getting now. As you know, the boy is famous as saying, "A system cannot fail." You know, those who never was you know served to protect. But intentionality can also be a good thing, meaning that to, to Dr. Uh, Love's point, that black educators at a particular time in history were intentional about pushing black students to their highest potential. And so several years ago, and I'm not, I, sh- I hate to shamelessly plug my work, but I think it, it fits right here. Several years ago, Dr. Poe, Dr. Croft, Dr. Jurgensen, Jer- and I wrote an article talking about a pedagogy of intentionality. And we, we, what we wanted to do is have a conversation about what was taking place at, you know, Emory at a particular time with a Dr. Joyce Irvine, with a Dr. Siddle Walker, with a Dr. Carol Hahn, and, 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 and all these professors who were educating the, you know, and Brian, you know this as well, who are educating social justice scholars, right? And, and you don't get this, you don't get time or you don't get this kind of department without being intentional about this, uh, about it. And so I, to Dr. Love's point, I think that's what has to be centered when we talk about, you know, education equality. What are we intentional? What, what are we intentional about? What, what, what is the, what, what are our goals for marginalized students, if it's if 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 our intention is to create whole people, right, to create individuals who are critical thinkers, who understand what they what they are bringing to the table, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of class, regardless of race, then we have to be intentional about it because the school system is intentional about taking that away from them. The school system is intentional about marginalizing them, and if we pretend that these things decade in, decade out, day in, day out, are just happenstance, then we are not connected to the history that has shown the type of education that public schools have always adopted is the type of education that marginalizes people and that elevates people. To Dr. Love's point about a 4.5, 4.7, all that stuff, that's intentional. It's a, 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 And that has real life consequences. So those students can go to college for only uh, you know two years or, or they, they're graduating college in a year and a half and two years, because they come pretty much as, as, as sophomores and juniors, right? And so we need to understand that there is an economical consequence, economic consequence, a psychological consequence, you know, all of these kind of, con- and it's intentional. So just as intentional as the school system is about marginalizing our children, we have to be that intentional, if not more, of making sure our children are not marginalized. So I, I think what Dr. Hobson, Dr. Love saying is, is, is are, 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 you know, are accurate, but, but the the thing I think we need to center that around is intentionality. Thank you. I think that I also want to make sure our, our participants and we got a crowd in here. We got 134 people in here with us, folks. So we got a good crowd in here. But I want to make sure the participants know 
that both the chat and the Q&A um, are open for you. So please, if you have questions yourself, please don't hesitate to ask a question, put it in the, the Q&A and we'll make sure that we ask it of our panelists. Um, so that idea of intentionality, because uh, I my, my, my take on that is that it is connected in some way to who we are, what our intentions are, and what our responsibility to those intentions are, right? So I have the intention, I understand that my work has to be centered in social justice. That, that is my fight. And so when I wake up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of my work I do with teachers and the work I do at schools and the work we do in the Crem Center. So it's connected in some ways to who I am. It's also connected to the community I am, I'm a part of. Because I also recognize that my great, 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 right, on back would be rolling over to see me doing things that did not serve my community. So this idea of identity, I think, is important. It's key. And, and, and it's not something that we talk a lot about in terms of schools or in terms of what we do as teachers, although it's something that we definitely have an impact on in the way that our children see themselves and the way that they see themselves in their community. It also, this idea of history helps them to understand why we are and where we are. Like, so I think about Maurice, you, your, your conversation about what happened in Atlanta during the Olympics that opened the door for gentrification here in Metro Atlanta. Right? So we are, if we understand that, it helps us to understand why and where we are. So can you talk a bit about this connection between history and identity, that next piece in our, in our theme, this idea of it helping us to understand who we are, both as individuals, but also as a community of people. And I don't know if we're going to stay with the order. We are, okay, I'd love to stand, yes. Uh, uh, okay, I, 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 job, I, easy. loud and clear. Loud and clear, uh, General. Um, so, you know, this is a great question. And for me, uh, this, is, this is my own opinion. I have very few opinions. Everything that I think about is based on fact. It's a part of how I am. Uh, but this is my opinion. For me, being a historian is spiritual work. Mm. And when I say spiritual, I mean loosely defined. I'm, I'm not here to kind of push or proselytize you. But for me, it's, it's important that I capture the voice of the people in the community, and you have to go amongst them to do so. So, you know, an interesting thing we talk about the I talk about the Olympification of Atlanta in my own research, and I look at it as a series of theoretical frameworks that work together that franchise cities for world consumption, but disfranchise, criminalize, demonize, and displace the indigenous people in a city like Atlanta who were overwhelmingly black. So, 1990, 1980. 90, the city of Atlanta was 67% black. Now it's 51% black. Black folk were pushed out and went to where, and all of that is due to the Olympification of Atlanta. But before I was tenured and promoted at Georgia State University, I would do these workshops with teachers and I would, I would move in the Sweet Auburn district, which has been gentrified by and large by Georgia State. And I was known for saying out loud that I am not loyal to Georgia State University. I am loyal to black communities. And one day I was pulled to the side by a university administrator and said, well, why would you say that? I said, because if you don't tenure me and promote me, this community is going to be the ones that will lift me up. They've already lifted me up. And what I was saying to them is that these are jobs, but the real work is really in the community. And so when we begin to understand where we are and what we do, you know, the, the cool thing about who I am, particularly in, the, in Atlanta and what I call the Black New South, uh, I, I am a 10 generation Southerner with Louisiana, Mississippi roots, uh, grew up in Alabama, I live in Atlanta, and I'm talking about, I promote this whole Black New South piece. Um, it means, you know, doctor means nothing when I go home to Selma, Alabama, or to Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Louisiana. It means nothing. I'm Maurice Hobson, or I'm Mo Hobson, or I'm Marvin's boy. I'm Joyce's son, I'm Eva Grace's grandson. And what's important about that is that when you step on the stage to really present these narratives, you carry all of them, plus the people that you study whose voices have not been heard, who have given real, real, real credence to what it is. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, when I was probably 10 years old, uh, I was playing soccer, playing with a whole lot of white kids, playing soccer. It was the only black kid that played soccer. And there was a, a town drunk that walked across the soccer field who just so happened to be the father of my mom's best friend. 
And so as this, this, this gentleman who, who struggled with alcohol was walking across the field, all of the white kids ran and they left. And they were like, oh my God, this man is coming. And I walked over to him and I said, how you doing, Mr. I'm just gonna say Jackson. How you doing, Mr. Jackson? He was like, hey boy, what's going on with you? Blah, 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 blah. When I went back to my soccer coach, they were like, oh my God, you weren't scared. How do you know that man? I was like, that's Mr. Jackson. What I'm saying is that we are here to interpret and help people understand what is on the ground. And that's the necessary connection that we must know and that we, that we must get to because when we remember who they are, we carry all of them with us as we move forward. Let me go in order. So, you know, I think this is, for me, this is a very interesting question being on this panel because I am not Southern. So I got all my Southern brothers on this panel. I am from the, I am from the cold, okay, the North. I am from upstate New York, Rochester, New York. 90 minutes from Canada, six hours from New York City. So when people say like upstate New York, I'm talking about, and, and we are the forgotten. People don't go past like Poughkeepsie. Like they don't even know where we are. So we're talking Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester. We're all, it, these are these working class, steel mill cities like it's, it's just working class folk black folk working class now my parents are southern now my father's from jacksonville florida and my mother's people is from south carolina so as talib Khalif say i got country cousins and so i knew what it was and my father was was determined not to be southern in upstate new york my father had a baby blue cadillac he had the white on the rims, white on the rims, leather. And I knew that when he shined that thing up, that we were driving for a full day to Florida. A full day. And my mother would get in that car and say the most egregious things about Southerners. Oh, you country mother. <laughs> we got to drive all the way down to the run. It's going to be high. Uh -huh. And so I say that because I think also to do this work, you have to understand who you are and the spaces that you come into. Now, I've been, in, I've, I've been raised in Atlanta. I spent my whole adult life in Atlanta. I've been in Atlanta almost 15 years. I spent my whole adult life here. And when I first got here, oh, I was a New Yorker at heart. You better, woo, you country, you, you can't be in community with folk. You can't think you're going to be doing the work with folk if you don't like the folk, if you don't understand your identity and how your identity intersects, disrupts, and is problematic at times with the folk that you are trying to do work with. And so what I had to realize one day is I love Andre 3000. Oh, I love that man. I love the way he says words. But I didn't love anybody else's Southern accent. And I said, well, what, why is that? Oh, I love, oh, oh, give me UGK, give me UGK any day. I'm on it any day. Ooh, I can't, I can't stand Alabama and Mississippi, Louisiana and all these, and Memphis. I can't stand these places. That's some internal work I had to do. And had everything to do about how I was raised, how I grew up, thinking that my state was the center of the world thinking that there was nothing beyond New York City. If it's not New York City, why are we even talking? And so it took work for me to come down here in the South and build community and build roots and undo all the things that I thought about Southerners, all the things that I thought about Southern people and Southerness and Southern culture. So I say that because you, you can't do this work in community. You can't do this work with our identities without some time understanding that our identities can be problematic. The things that we learned and grew up with can be problematic. You can't do this work in communities with identities that hold on to homophobia, hold on to transphobia, hold on to fat phobia. Like we gotta understand how we unpack this stuff to be able to come in communities and be our authentic selves, but also understanding don't come in these communities unless you've done that work. And as a Northerner, as a proud Northerner, you know, if you see me anytime outside of work, I got on a Yankees hat. I go to a Yankees game every single year. When the Yankees sometimes interleague play, play the Braves, oh, you better believe I'm there. I love it. I live and breathe it. 
I take New York hip hop seriously. But at the end of the day, Georgia, Atlanta is my home. And I had to understand that those identities that I grew up with that are problematic to where I want to call home, where my children call home, my wife is from the South. I had to do away with that stuff. I had to unpack that stuff and I had to let that stuff go. And so I tell people all the time, I'm a New York, Georgia peach. I'm a New York, Georgia peach out here. But it takes work. So I just want us to make sure that we're understanding that sometimes our identities don't come whole and intact for who we need to be in these communities to do this particular type of work. And we got to unpack that. And it took me about four or five years being down here to really start to unpack that and be proud to live in Atlanta, be proud to be a Southerner, be proud to have raised my kids in the South. Now, that's the worst thing you can do as a New Yorker is raise your kids in the South. I had to be proud of that. I want them to be born and raised in Atlanta. I want to live in the city of Atlanta, right? I want that for them. I want them to have those experiences. I want them to be proud of that. And so it takes work sometimes of who we grew up and what we know and what we've been told to undo that and come into communities and really serve the communities. But sometimes we don't come all fully intact to do that work. We got to unpack. Tina, you're getting a lot of love. People saying they're very happy. That you're a part of this southern community, this southern family down here. Absolutely. Happy to have you. Happy to have you. Yeah, I, th I think the, the 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 question about identity is so is 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 such an important you know question because I think like Dr. Love said, you know, you you can't do this work unless you are um, immersed in community. And, and Dr. Hobbs said the same thing. And, and, and again, they they've done the heavy lifting, so I I, I just throw in my my, my little two cents. Um, I am a country boy at heart, you know, I, I never really, you know, thought anything was better than the South. You know, even when I, I've, I've been blessed to travel throughout the world and, 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 and they, they've all come up short. Um, but like, like, like Dr. Love say, I, you know, that that's some, some reflections that we have to, you know, do if, if we're going to do this work. But I do think the, 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 the self-reflection part that I want to touch on Dr. Love, because my grandmother, she's my great grandmother, we call her grandmother. She used to say, you know, love demands something. And she always used to say that, you know, that, that, that love demands something. And I, and I do think the criticality piece uh, Dr. Love, that you brought up earlier, it's, it's very important to do the work that we do. You know, I don't write outside of my countries. And what I mean by that, like when I, when I, when I work on something, when I, when I teach, everything I do is formed by demanding something. I demand that we have a more accurate depiction of people. I demand that people don't accept anti-blackness. I, you know what, we all grew up where they talked about black males being a dangerous species and black women being ghetto uh, mob. And none of that was ever true, right? That even the data in real time, right, was never accurate. And so I demand that 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 that, that we use a much more accurate, you know, depiction. Of, of, of what it is. And so that identity shapes the work that I do. It shapes the type of researcher I am, the shape the teacher I am, it shapes the service work that I do. Everything, like, you know, everything that I do is centered around what my grandmother, Margaret Crabb, used to say to me in my family when, when I was young, like love demands something. And so whether to, to your point, Dr. Love, when I hear family members being homophobic or when I hear you know, people outside of my community being racist or whatever case may be, that, that that same core mean I have to demand something from you. I have to I have to demand that that whatever it is in you that we work on. And, and I, I end with this because Dr. Love work made me think of um, Glaw's work on 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 Baldwin. And since you started with Baldwin, I think it's good to bring Baldwin back. And it was like the the work that we do causes you know you know critique you know. Of a, of a of a society, but also cause the critique within. We have to reflect on the work that we do, right? The the, the things that the, the messiness that's within us. And I think your your question, um, what Brian speaks to that. It's like we can't do this work without you know this kind of self reflection. I mean, it, to me, it's therapeutic, right? It 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 it, it, cha it challenges me. If I'm going to demand you know somebody be much more equitable based on race, I need to be much more equitable based on you know, in any sexist ideologies I have, any homophobic ideologies I have, any in, 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 in any any you know xenophobic you know ideologies I have, and all of this all of this work is to 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 push us to a much more equitable 
society. That doesn't mean that you can't, you, like I tell you all the time, you know, to, to Maurice's point about conversion, you can believe what you want to believe. But as society, if, if we are to live in a society, you have to respect other people's right to be as well. And 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 and, and that work, I think, is is important to our identity. And, and I don't, I don't, as, as I, you know, say I don't leave home without, I, I never enter a space where that is not the center. And I think that's important as well. We got some questions, got a couple of questions, and we're, we're we're almost right at the end. So I'm going to merge these questions a bit, right? So I think it speaks to this idea of vision, where we're headed. So there's a question about how do we prepare our teachers uh, to be justice oriented, you know, to take on local justice issues, uh, to center justice, to center equity in their work. Specifically, uh, Bettina, there's a question here about abolitionist teaching practices and preparing teachers to use those. And, and, and to your work, Vincent, I, I, I always say, look, if we focus on teachers alone, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle here. How do we also prepare our students? Because to, to Bettina's uh, point earlier about what we know for our past is that when it comes to justice work, when it comes to the, a lot of this has been led by our young people. And it continues to be led by our young people today. So two pieces here, you know, and speak to the one that resonates with you, but how do we do the work of preparing teachers to do this? And how do we prepare our young people also to do this? Well, I'll take the question first uh, and break the order, but I also want Mo Hobbs to jump in because if I'm not mistaken, and I know you do a lot of work on political campaigns, 90% of youth ages 18 to 24 in Atlanta voted? That's the work we've been putting down. Yes, that is correct. And 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 I've been hard on them, but I love them. And the, I, we'll talk about that in a minute. I, so so I I just I just want us to understand. You know, when we got to catch up. We are sitting here saying, you know, what's going on with the youth? That's because our schools are making us believe that our youth are not engaged. Our schools. I, I keep telling folks, folks are learning. These kids are on TikTok and Twitter doing activist work and now we and everybody says okay are they gonna move from the phone to the polls they did they actually did and so we think about we what we want schools to be doing how we want teachers to prepare we got to see ourselves as putting get into the fight get into the fight there's there's there, it's not rocket science get yourself and your students into the fight. White supremacy takes no days off, no sick leave, no PTO, no vacation. They don't take it. So it's always going to be there. And so the idea is get into the fight. Start to teach from a revolutionary stance. Start to teach about Black people's not just pain, teach about our joy, teach about our love, teach about our resistance. And that's where schools go wrong. You want to start our... Everybody's going to start school with George Floyd. Why are you going to start my story with George Floyd? Why are you going to start my story with Breonna Taylor? Yes, those things are important for our kids to know, but that's not where our story begins. And so if teachers want to be serious about doing this work, read, become an intellectual, get into communities with folk and figure out how ways in which you can bring that back to your schools. And understand, as my brother David Starball always tells me, he says, love, the work if they make you believe, he always says, you know, you know, I'm sure we all get calls to take these positions in leadership, you know, come be, come do this, come do that. And he says, listen, don't let them make you believe that you can make change by yourself. It's ahistorical for you to make change by yourself. As a teacher, you have so much power. There is hopefully there. I, I hope there are 20 and 30 more people in that in that school ready to fight with you. But y'all have not activated yourself. There are parents ready. Everybody's ready to go. Just trying to figure out where we go. And that's why we built Abolition Teacher Network to say, here's a hub. Let's go. The time is now as the, seize the time, as Elaine Brown told us, seize the time. Right. So the work is the work is out there. We have to stop like, what do I do? Where do I start? Work on yourself first. Don't come into people's spaces. You haven't done your own work. And then there's so much to do. We just got to get to work. We just got to get, get out of each other's way yes. and realize that young people are changing this country. 
they are demanding of us. So what I tell people, if you are 35 or up, don't worry about change. Dismantle. Don't worry about change. Let the kids change it. They, they know what they want. But the problem is we keep trying to change. Just dismantle the structure so we can have change. So all my 35 and up, don't worry. Let the kids, let the kids gonna figure out what they want. They tell us what they want. But the problem is the kids always got to come and try to undo the system, then change it. What if the kids came into a system that was being undone and they could apply their ideas? So start to destroy this thing. Disrupt it, agitate it. That's our job. I, I just want to say this really quickly. Uh, as you all may not know this, but uh, Dr. Love, Vince, uh, Dr. Willis and myself, we're academic, like first cousins. I mean, when you come out of a school of a, you know, Dr. Asa Hillier and a Dr. Benetta, Vanessa Siddle Walker and Dr. James Anderson, I mean, you know, that they teach you like you got to go holler at those people who are studying on those folks. But I, um, I, I was working on an article that's titled Teaching Public History as Dialogue, Place-Based Histories and Public Memory as a uh, curriculum for Atlanta teachers. I do a lot of work with school systems too. And I wanna make, just give this quote really quickly that was given by Dr. James Anderson, who was my dissertation advisor. He currently serves as the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois. This is what he, what he stated. I've always been interested in history as a dialogue between the past and present. I know there's a part of me where I could write history just for professional historians. But when I think about my work, I'm thinking always about the kind of history that I would deliver to prospective teachers, that I would deliver to superintendents and principals. What it is about is a dialogue between the past and present that informs their orientation, that informs their thinking, and the ways in which they go about not only the practice of education or managing education systems, but even in terms of their consciousness of the past and as it relates to the present. What I'm saying is that we are weapons and our mind is, we are, our minds are weapons. I mean, like we are part of what we call the black renegade intelligentsia who has gone into this world, taken what they've got, gotten and we have to give it back to the people. And this is the only way that we can survive. And I just end uh, real quickly about Dr. Love's point about youth. And I think history, again, is, is another guy. Like youth have, you know, but, Particularly, you know, you know, marginalized, marginalized youth have a very clear ideal of the kind of world they want, right? And and and, and we have to tap into that, right? And, and and so, as 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 any of us who are who are interested in equalizing education, to do that without the ideas of children being included, to me is disingenuous, right? It's 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 a false narrative. Um, or it's a, it, it, it's it's a to me a, a, a goal that's that's unattainable, and so if you have in your school or if you have in your community um, ideas about you know changing the system or to Dr. Love's you know point dismantling the system, and there are no young people around, I think you are um, in a conversation with 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 no, that conversation not going anywhere. And, and and I would say this is someone who who really followed the voice, uh, you know, particularly black youth for the last fifteen years. The 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 profound um, insight that they have, like hit, like you know, even if you think about black youth coming up, you know, I studied a generation that was going to school after Brown was decided, right? These these kids were born, you know, were going to school in the fifties and the sixties. So the law said that they had equal, you know. Uh, equal access, but they knew that that, that, that that what Brown was, they wanted so much more, right? They wanted to be treated as human beings. They wanted resources. They, I mean, so like these, they, the, the, the profound things in which they were asking for, I think even if you start there, right, are children being treated as, as human beings? If, if, if you can't check mark that, then focus on that. Are children given uh, equal resources to compete? In, in, in a digitized world. If you can't check that, start there. I mean, and so I think if we just go down the list of what children have demanded historically and what they continue to demand, just start with a checklist. And if, if you can't check those things off the list, then therein lies the therein lies the fight. As Dr. Love said, that that to me, so so we don't have to act as if or pontificate 
you know, about what needs to be done. Start with the ideas of black youth or start with the ideas of marginalized youth. What are they saying that they are, are not with about? And I'm not saying, I mean, we can ignore the, 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 the students got 4.3s and 4.5s and 4.7s because the system is working for them. Hmm. But the students with 1.8s and, and 2.8s or, 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 or 0.5s, you know, ask, start, start asking them what is wrong with education. And, 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 and therein lies the answer. And, and you can focus your energy on those individuals or, or, or those communities. And, 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 and that's where the fight to me that, that, that Cram and, and, and others of us who are concerned with this can continue because therein lies the answer. And I think, you know, uh, you know, we, 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 we to, to Dr. Hobson's point, it's not, I mean, I don't know why we keep saying it's not rocket science. Do we even know rocket science is a hard science? I mean, you know, and I don't mean like hard to stop. I mean, if I'm really good at like math, can I figure out rocket science? I don't know why we say it's not rocket science. But anyway, tomorrow, to Dr. Hobson's point, uh, we, we we have the answers to this test. So let's not pretend as if we don't have the answers. And youth, That's right. regardless of, of 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 where they are, they can tell you what they can they can tell you what I envision for education. If you start off an assignment to Monday morning and ask your sec primary and secondary children, or even as parents, ask your children, what kind of education do you want? What 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 would be a good education to you? And even if they are not coherent about it, you can pick out some buzzwords. You know, I know Marvel, you know, sons are, are around the same age. And I know my kids, they want to be, they want to feel like they're important. They want to, they want to see themselves in, in, in that day. And if they don't see themselves in that day, then that's a problem with that. that that's that therein lies the problem. So how do you create a curriculum that, 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 that perpetuate, I mean, that, that, that illustrates all of these individuals. And so I think that that would be to me um, one one thing we can do Monday morning, and we can come back with a Google Doc and say, "Hey, you know, this is what we found. The ideas of 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 of, of children are, you know, from from these particular areas, and we can just you know cloud those areas and say, you know, to college education, these are what this quick little survey is what children said they want to see in their curriculum. Let's focus on three of these." Can I just say this real quick? Before we, you know, I think we have to stop letting people off the hook. Right. You know, I, I, I can't stand when we have educators that say, well, you know, I just don't understand what's going on. I don't know. Have you watched the television? Do you see what's going on? Do you have Twitter, TV, anything? Right. White folks can study everything. They can study Japanese culture. They can study the Holocaust. We are now seeing white women study black culture so well, they think they black. Hmm. So now you're telling me, so, so, when, so when we let people off the hook, the reason they don't want to study us and learn is because it implicates them. But they can study everything else. White folks can tell you everything about somebody else, but can't, can't really understand what's going on with black people because it implicates them. And we got to stop letting them off the hook, tell them that they're fragile, telling them that, they, you know, it's OK. No. You started it. You tear it down. Right. You yeah. started it. You learn about it. It is your responsibility. Yeah. We have to stop letting them off the hook. You this is not, they, they can study every damn thing else. Make money off of it. How can you how can you not understand black culture, but you understand enough to market it, to make money off of it? To make sure it's profitable, but we asked you about justice. I don't know. Well, you, hey, you don't know. You know enough to steal it. Right, right, right. So we, 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 we have to stop letting these folks off the hook for the damage that they are doing. And I mean, they, they keep throwing rocks and hiding their hands, and we act like we don't know where the hands got thrown from. Right. Don't let them off the hook. Right. Don't let these teachers say, "Well, I don't know where to start." You know where to start for everything else. Right. Right. We, 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 we have to demand more of our educators. Yeah, you're right. Thank you, Patina. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. This was very selfish of me to put this panel together. <laughs> you know, the three of you uh, to have an opportunity to have you together and have a conversation. But I'll also say this. I think this was extremely important for this particular conference in this context at this time in our history. 
And I'm hoping that the people that have been here today, I, well, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, so if you all want to put your thanks in the chat, put your comments in the chat, please do so. And thank these amazing, amazing scholars, uh, activists, organizers, researchers, educators. Uh, you all do so much for our world. And so I appreciate you taking an hour of your time to share your genius with us. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know. What else to say. I, don't, I don't know what else to say. I, I, you got you got people thanking you in the chat, throwing lots of love your way. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Much yeah, love. Be healthy, y'all. Be strong. Wear your mask. Let me say this. Let me say this because I, I think this is important. So I think five years or four years ago, we we did Maurice's book at the Sources Conference. We have an annual book talk at the Sources Talk uh, Conference. We we did uh, Maurice's book. I think a couple of years later, we did Bettina's book at, at the Sources Conference. So Vincent, I'm just letting you know, man. Hey, we are the best. This I already week. told you to, it's a date. It's, it's a date. We, we there. It's it's you see it's, it's, it's my homeboy, it's my homeboy Traven say you say go, I say go. All right. We will see you <laughs> next year for your book talk, sir. We will Vince Willis's you. book is gonna be that fire. I, I'm fire. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate y'all. Love, love, love. Don't get one, get two. That's right. That's right. I appreciate y'all. Much love. Love y'all, brothers. Be safe, stay strong. Love you too. Thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you all. All right, folks. Thank you for participating in our keynote uh, and, and for our scholars and for our, our panelists. Um, we are moving now into our first concurrent session. Uh, what you're gonna do is if you go to uh, the program on at the sources website, you'll see a little link underneath the next set of conference presentations. And you can select the one that you'd like to go to. We've got amazing uh, sessions, concurrence this year. And what you're going to put in is the password, which is 2020, and then in all caps, C-U-E-E, -E, and then sources with a capital S. Once again, you're going to put in 2020, C-U-E-E, -E, C-U-E-E is all caps, and then sources with a capital S, and you'll go in and you'll enjoy the next round of amazing speakers we have. Thank you for joining us at our keynote. I'll see you later in the conference. Maurice, Vincent, Patina, thank you again. All right, take care. All right, here we go. So welcome back, everybody. It is wonderful to see you. Uh, thank you for being here at the 15th Annual Sources of Urban Educational Excellence Conference. I'm Brian Williams. I'm the director of the CRIM Center, the center that hosts this dynamic conference every single year. And we're really, really happy that you're here with us. Uh, we want to ask your forgiveness for the technical if issues. We have some technical technical issues with our breakout sessions there. We are fixing the problem for our later concurrent session. So we should not have a problem with the later concurrent sessions, but we did have a bit of an issue with the earlier session. We apologize, and we're looking to try to figure out a way to get those sessions recorded and up on the website so that you can still get a chance to witness some of that amazing work. Um, so right now we're gonna move into our next large session. And I'm here to introduce Dr. Calvin Mackey of STEMNOLA. Uh, Calvin Mackey and I are friends, we go way back. Uh, and I'm very excited because I know a bit about the amazing work he's doing in the city I call home, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, and so we're gonna get a chance to spend some time with Calvin. As usual, I'm gonna ask that if you got questions, if you got comments, Please use the chat. Uh, please use the Q and A, and we'll make sure we get those uh, those questions over to Calvin. But let me tell you something a little bit about Dr. Calvin Mackey. Uh, Dr. Calvin Mackey is, a, is an award winning mentor, inventor, author, former engineering professional, uh, professor, internationally renowned speaker, and successful entrepreneur. Dr. Mackey is the founder of STEM NOLA, a nonprofit organization founded to expose inspire 
and engage communities about the opportunities in STEM. In seven years, STEM NOLA has engaged over 50,000 mostly low-income, low-resource K-12 students in hands-on in hands-on project-based STEM activities in New Orleans communities. I think it's important to note that Calvin is doing this work in New Orleans, Louisiana. Mackie graduated from Morehouse College, earned a BS in mathematics in 1990, and was simultaneously awarded a BS in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, where he subsequently earned his master's and PhD in mechanical engineering in 1996. He served on the engineering faculty at Tulane University for 12 years. Mackey has won numerous awards, including the 2003 Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring in a White House ceremony and currently serves on the Louisiana STEM Advisory Council. Dr. Mackey is author of two award-winning books, A View from the Roof, Lessons, Lessons for Life and Business, and Grandma's Hands, Chairs Moments of Faith and Wisdom. He is also a devoted husband to his wife, Tracy, and father to his two sons, Miles Ahmad and Mason, and Mason Amir. Calvin, I'm really excited that you're here as somebody who is committed and devoted to, uh, to science and science education and making sure our children have access to that type of work. I'm excited about the work that you're doing and I'm excited that you're here today to share a bit with the, uh, the people that are here from sources. So uh, thank you and the floor is yours, sir. Hey, thank you, Brian. Uh, you know, we've come a long way since we was running around Atlanta, uh, being a little uh, nappy headed boys that we were thinking that we knew something in college. So man, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, thank you to the participants uh, at the conference uh, for receiving me. Uh, but today I want to talk about rethinking STEM outreach and engagement, building capacity through building community. Just tell you a little bit about me. Brian told you about my four STEM degrees, but in actuality, I started Morehouse in remedial reading, developmental mathematics. I grew up in a house with no books in New Orleans where my father dropped out of school in eighth grade to pick cotton and my mother went to state approved Negro high school. I'm from back of town, Girktown, Zion City. I'm from the lower nine where we don't mind dying. I'm from that wild magnolia, I thought I told you. I'm from that CP3. You know you know me. See, Brian, they don't understand. What I'm trying to say is that I started from the bottom, and now I'm here. And by the time this, by the time this presentation is over, hopefully they can realize, they're going to realize I can go from zero to 100 real quick. So just like uh, Lil, uh, the Lil Wheezy and, and Baby and Master P, everybody in New Orleans can spit, but today I'm spitting about STEM. And I start off like that because a lot of times in STEM, we perceive somebody to be something that we think they should be instead of who allowing them to be who they are to be what they need to be to their community. Like Brian said, I was a professor at Tulane for 12 years. I was the first and only African-American ever tenured in the history of the College of Engineering at Tulane University. I used to go to work every day listening to Tupac, Me Against the World, and I leave every day listening to Biggie, Who Shot You? Then the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Tulane made an unbelievable decision. Tulane decided to keep the football team and eliminate the engineering program. One of my buddies called me, who was a football coach. He said, Mackie, whoever thought you'll still be, I'll still be here coaching football when, and you'll be gone as a tenured faculty member. I said, well, man, maybe the little brothers in the hood got it right. He said, what you mean? I said, maybe I should have been doing wind sprints when I was studying calculus because the message that the president of Tulane University sent to black and brown kids all over this country is that you can come to this university and run that rock, dunk that ball, hit that pill, stop, drop it like it's hot and entertain us. But don't you think about coming to this university and getting a science, technology, engineering or mathematics degree and saving yourself and your community from the next natural disaster. Isn't it funny in the middle of COVID, they still got our brothers out there bumping their heads of a pipe dream of going to the NFL. Uh, but yet and still, uh, it's easier for young black men to get into these universities playing football than it is for a young black male to get into these universities to pursue a STEM degree. You know, sometimes, Brian, I think higher education has become like hospital with doctors that don't want sick patients. Everybody want to be called a doctor. And for me, education means to take out of the darkness and bring it to the light. And it seemed like higher ed go out and so-called recruit the best of who we are 
and then uh, make sure that we don't get sick in, a, in four years and then brag about the fact that our well patients didn't get sick. If we are doctors, if we are educators, show me your triage unit, show me your age unit, show me your cancer unit, show me who you are saving. And that brings me to STEM NOLA, because when they kicked me out of Tulane University, I see the president now, and I said, you low down. He said, Mackie, it wasn't personal. I said, yeah, it was personal. You should have fired me five years earlier, because if you'd have fired me five years earlier, that would have put me closer to my purpose and my dream of working in our community and showing our kids the possibilities of the 21st century. So what we built in New Orleans is a, is a authentic, credible STEM ecosystem that's engaging the entire community in STEM and is transforming the way education is being delivered in the classroom. Again, I'm Calvin Mackey. You can find me at Twitter at, at STEMNOLA, at Calvin Mackey. Uh, and you can email me at info at stemnola.com. The future leaders will change the world. For me, I have, I, Brian, my son, I have a 17 year old son that's applying to college now, and I have a, I have a uh, sophomore. And my sophomore is, you know, he, he's, he's very artsy. He, he has command of the English language. And we have these big STEM programs on Saturday. As a matter of fact, we have one going on right now, and we actually engage in kids as far away as uh, Tanzania today. And one Saturday, my son told me, he said, Daddy, I don't want to go to STEM Saturday. I said, why? He said, because I don't want to be a scientist or an engineer. And I realized right then and there, even my two sons, who was getting STEM from the womb, uh, was turning against what we was doing because maybe, just maybe, I was speaking to them or delivering it to them or presenting, to, presenting it to them in a wrong way. And I had to change the messaging because we have to realize STEM is just not about making people a scientist or an engineer but it's giving them those 21st century skills that they need to compete, which is collaboration, uh, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. So we had the conversation and now my son is like the spokesperson for STEM NOLA. My other son is like the, you know, the, uh, the technical uh, uh, advisor for STEM NOLA. He'd get to buy all these uh, STEM things and try them out and tell us what we should be doing. And what that let me know is that we got to find we got to create pathways for kids to find themselves. We can't put them in things where we think they should be. So the future leaders of tomorrow will change the world. And I love this. This is my goddaughter. And she showed up at my STEM event. And she said, forget princess. I want to be a scientist. I gave her $100. Say, look at that. You know how to get me. You know how to get me. America has a STEM problem. And you know, when America has a cold, I mean, black people and brown people have the flu. So. If we are bleeding and not producing the, the, the number of STEM people that we need as a nation, guess what's happening in black and brown, low income and low resource communities? The students and the kids in the urban areas and in low income rural areas are not getting what they need in order to uh, have the skills to participate in the 21st century. And for me, the question has always been why, why, why? And that's why I started out by telling you that I grew up in a house with no books and started more house in remedial reading and developmental mathematics. And 11 years later, at Georgia Tech, I had four STEM degrees and a PhD in engineering because something transpired from the time that I got to Morehouse in those 11 years when I left Georgia Tech. And what I've been trying to do is put that into a package that we can replicate it across the nation so that our kids, like the black boys who want to play football, our kids who are genius in STEM will know that there's a place for them. Uh, STEM NOLA is an organization we founded over seven years ago to expose and inspire and engage communities. In this uh, presentation, I will describe the model to you uh, and how we do what we do uh, to do the things that we have done. And some of the outcomes is that, like Brian said, we've engaged over 50,000 kids, mostly low income, low resource. But more importantly, what he didn't say, and we'll talk about, is that Brian, this year in revenue, we're going to do over $2 million. You see, you, you, you can't be, we've built an ecosystem that's absolutely sustainable. It's not only replicable, but it's sustainable. We just won a $3 million federal grant from the Department of Defense, and we are a grassroots community-based organization, and now we are competing in STEM outreach. So when we start talking about developing a, you know, a technical pipeline, a workforce pipeline, usually when we look at, when we start at the pipe, we usually start in the middle of the pipe. And I keep bringing up the NFL and the NBA because the NFL and the NBA make sure that every black boy touches a football before the age of four. There's over 3,000 universities. There's 300 engineering schools. There's something like 400 uh, colleges that have football teams in Division One, Two, II, and Three, and not one of those colleges ever have a problem finding a black boy to play football. 
As a matter of fact, the NFL got 32 teams, 1,500 players. If you look at the NFL and the NBA, they may have 2,500 employees at the most, and they never have a problem finding black and brown. The NFL and NBA don't have diversity problems. So my problem is, my question is, if they don't have a diversity problem, what are they doing such that corporate America keeps saying they can't find people like me and my sons? And that's because the NFL and the NBA know exactly how to solve the problem that we claim we can't solve in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And when a kid comes out of the womb, they put a football and basketball in their hand in their house in their community. When our kids go to school and play basketball, when our kids go to school and run track, when our kids go to school and play football, when they leave school, you know what they have access to? They have access to track. They have access to football. They have access to basketball. So when I talk about creating a cradle-to-career pipeline, when I talk about putting STEM in the hands of every kid, especially black and brown and low resource, then people say, well, have you done the research? Did you show that can get funded? Now, what are we going to do? Why would you want to do that? I said, damn, I thought we were trying to solve the problem. No, we haven't solved the problem because they don't want to solve the problem because they know at the top of this uh, pyramid, there's only a finite number of spaces. The only way you get a degree from MIT is if you go. And if you're not properly prepared coming out of the cradle, guess where you're not going to go? You're not going to go to MIT. You're not going to go to Georgia Tech. You're not going to go to University of Michigan. You're not going to go to Morehouse or Howard. And the thing is, we got to make sure that our children are getting what they need from the cradle. We can't start when they're in middle school. We can't start when, when they're in high school. We have to start introducing this stuff to them coming out of the womb. So we built an ecosystem from the ground up. Brian, we actually, we started early STEM. We have a, a six month old, a PK three. Then we have a pre-K four to second grade uh, cohort. We have a third through fifth cohort, a six through eight and a ninth through 12th. And we give age appropriate, grade appropriate, uh, curriculum aligned STEM to our kids in the community. What we've done is that we built an ecosystem. And if your ecosystem, if you start talking about STEM and education and you start at the school door, I don't want to have a conversation with you. You have to start the conversation about education in the community. And we, 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 I didn't even start dealing with schools. I don't even want to talk to schools. Schools are broken. Schools are relics. Schools are like something that is a dinosaur that we keep giving mouth to mouth and hoping that one day it's going to turn into something else. So what we've done is that we go into public facilities like the recreation facility, the library, anywhere where people allow us we have these big STEM, these big STEM events. And we call people, we make a call to the community and the people that want the STEM come out. And the reason why it works is because the people, the last thing a parent wanna know is that another kid is getting something that their kid is not. So over the last seven years, we've been able to create momentum in the community where, where, where ladies and men are telling their kids, I go to the barber shop and like, hey man, doc, I can't get my kid doing that STEM stuff, man. I mean, I mean, they're in a beauty salon talking, talking about STEM. I mean, we have branded STEM so much in New Orleans that people start calling me when Obama was president talking about STEM. They said, man, you got that patent because Obama stole your stuff. We are bringing STEM to the community. Instead of hiring these PR firms, instead of going over to the, to the communication department at the university, Brian, I hired the guys that, that promote the uh, hip hop parties and the hip hop concerts. I said, the people I'm trying to reach, you know how to reach them. So we run the our STEM ecosystem almost like a political campaign. In 0405, I did a sabbatical at the University of Michigan where I was supposed to be doing steam reforming of hydrocarbons. But every week I spent time talking to people about community organizing, political organizing, communication, marketing, and advertising. Because the issue is we have to be able to create the right narrative to speak to the community that will get them to respond. Entertainers know how to do it. Politicians know how to do it. And as educators, I challenge you to know how to speak outside of your, uh, 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 you know, your culturally relevant pedagogical uh, training and go back to your roots and speak to the community such that they can understand what you're saying and we can move them. So we've organized our communities. The universities don't like this because the universities believe they should be the end all. And I'm going to put them in a little box over to the right. And I told them, if you wanted to engage the community too, and you had 100 damn years, you haven't done it, guess what? You ain't going to do it. So now we don't have diversity questions about STEM in the city of New Orleans now, because with 50,000 kids and 12,000 families in a database, if anybody got a program, we can push a button and diversify their program. So don't tell me when you got an all white STEM camp that is all white because you couldn't find black people. It's all white because that's what you wanted. What we've done is that we've created a high-functioning community. 
I see Brian have behind him the Sankofa bird. If you go to Ghana and you study the, the Dinka symbols and the, the Khan people, and you go look at highly structured communities, highly structured, highly functioning communities, a child-centered, adult-governed elder rule. These communities have standards, structures, and strategies. So in our high-functioning STEM communities, we gotta have a structure. And that structure is, we focus on K-12 kids. And then we surround those K-12 kids the, with the adults. The adults in our community are the college kids. In any high-functioning community, you pay the adults. The reason why uh, 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 over-incarceration destroyed our community in the way that it did is because in a high-functioning community, the adults gotta carry the load. They gotta work 40 to 80 hours a week. They gotta create the wealth and the money to free up the elder so the elder can have time to pour into the kid. So the elder in our community, in our STEM community, are the STEM professionals and the teachers and the educators. So they volunteer. The college students work. In the last seven years, we put over a million dollars in the hands of college students, deploying them out into the community doing STEM. So if you can imagine these concentric circles, we call this vertical mentoring. So at any one of our events, a kid in the third grade can look up and see him or herself in the 12th grade, can look up and see him or herself in college, the college students can look up and see him and herself as professionals. The professionals can look down and see where they were and then give the, the students advice for based on where they were. So these events, you know, pre-COVID, two, three, four hundred people showing up in a gym. And this wasn't a one-time event. I went to MIT and they said, we do that once a year. I said, I do it every month. And we've done it every month, minimally for the last seven years. Uh, our solution, our solution is, engagement, uh, accessibility, and relevance. We believe we have to engage people where they are. So I don't have STEM events on the college campus. I don't have it even at schools because with the charter movement in New Orleans, they competing. So if I go have the STEM event at one charter, they're gonna tell the kids don't go to that charter, that foolishness. So we have the STEM events in the community and we engage people where they are. How do we expect somebody to come to something that they don't even know? So when you put the STEM in the community and they can see it, touch it and feel it, then they can say, what is that? I wanna do that. So we make sure that the STEM is accessible to all. So we ask two questions. Do you get free lunch and what's your zip code? We ask, do you get free lunch? Because if you get free lunch, you get this for free. And we want your zip code because I want to show the, the government and the politicians and educators that we're engaging people from zip codes that otherwise may not get this. And we have to make sure that the STEM is relevant. Why in the hell in New Orleans would we be teaching kids in earth science about earthquakes and volcanoes when we just damn near drowned? And they do that stupid foolishness, you know, in earth science, telling our kids about volcanoes and water flowing past the school. So we've created curriculum that is aligned the standards that's relevant to the kids. So our circuits day, they do it build traffic lights. And when they walk out, they see a traffic light. On our earth science day, they actually build levees and wetlands and they have a competition. Uh, on our rocket day, Boeing is down the street building the largest rocket in the world in our community. So we have a rocket day. And I forget, I remember when I went to Boeing and wanted them to sponsor, they wouldn't sponsor, right? I told Boeing to call your public relations because you're about to have some relations in the public. And then I wrote all of my politicians and I said, you all need to find better corporate uh, partners because I want to have a rocket day. And those people over there building the largest rocket in the world and said, they're not interested. And I CC'd Boeing. Uh, see, since I've done that, Boeing has given us over $150,000. You have to force the issue and make people to do right by our children in the community when they're extracting from us. We believe STEM gotta be hands-on. You know, as educators, a lot of time we just wanna talk. STEM is hands-on. You know, science, Brian, I know you're gonna get mad with me. Science tell you what is, engineering create that which never was before. So when we're talking about STEM, STEM is any, uh, any collaboration of these two things. A lot of people say they got a STEM program. I said, no, you got a science program. They say, well, I got a STEM program. I said, no, you got a technology program. Now, if you're doing technology in science, or you're doing engineering in math, now we're talking about STEM. My thing is this, right? When you got hands on, the minds are on. We got up to 200 kids right now on Zoom doing STEM, parents picked up kids, and you cannot be doing hands on and your minds are not on. So everything that we do ends with the kids doing something hands on. Uh, our services, just like anybody else, we have summer camps, we have in-school programs, out-of-school programs, we have private labels, and we have STEM kits and curriculum. And we built our own STEM kits and curriculum because like I said, we didn't want to pull anything off the shelf. We wanted to create STEM that's culturally and environmentally relevant to our kids. And that's the way we've been able to create the economics behind this because the STEM kits that we've developed 
they align with the economic drivers in the community. So Boeing cannot not sponsor me if I'm doing a damn rocket day. I didn't go to Boeing and say, uh, sponsor this black male mentoring program. I went to Boeing and say, give me money to teach these kids about rocketry. We have a utility module. I go to the utility company and say, give me money to teach these kids about utility. We have a, uh, a transportation module. How the transportation people not gonna give me money to teach kids about transportation? So when we change our mindset, then that creates a value proposition that we can challenge people to do what's right. Uh, uh, Pre-COVID, we used to go into a gym. We go into public facilities and we convert them to laboratories. We would show up three hours early at 6 a.m. in the morning. We'll take 200 tables and 400 chairs. We take uh, 50 tables and 400 chairs and turn gyms into laboratories and invite up to 200 kids. At the bottom, what you saw was actually five years ago was our first heart and circulation day where we had up to 200 kids dissecting sheep hearts with uh, medical students, pre-med students, and more importantly, surgeons, doctors, and healthcare professionals. Literally, parents had tears in their eyes because they saw, they saw the possibilities for their kids. So not only are we engaging the kids, we are changing the mindset and the possibility in the parents' head of what's possible for their kids. Think about it. The only time most people get to meet a doctor, especially uh, hell, middle-class kids, is when they're sick. So now we've created an environment where these doctors can engage with these kids in a healthy environment of, of, of hopefulness rather than one where, where they are sick. And it's an amazing day. Now, why I bring this up, our community understand becoming a doctor. Even right now, the number of black males going to medical school, medical school last year was less than the number that actually entered in like 1975. So even though we understand becoming a doctor, there are cultural narratives out there that's running our kids away from even becoming a doctor. So we got to have community-based programs to introduce our kids to other professionals, to other professions, and other people that they can feel, touch, and get to know and say, hey, I can be her, I, I can be him. And to see these young kids looking into the, the eyes of doctors that look like them, it was absolutely transformative. Uh, but like I said, our hands-on STEM is culturally relevant. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see where the kids are building levees. Uh, down below, you see where they're doing wind energy and fuel cells and up, the, up above, they're doing hydrodynamics. So we do many things that otherwise, uh, bring kids together, get them to compete, and let them find themselves. I often tell people I hate biology, I hate chemistry, I hate electrical engineering, and I say that because I really do, but I got a PhD in mechanical engineering. And I tell that to kids because just because you came on uh, electrical engineering day and you didn't like it, that doesn't mean this isn't for you. You gotta keep coming because we gotta find what's for you. Now, we just signed a deal with, with, with Grambling State University, uh, backed by Magic Johnson. So last weekend, we had a STEM Saturday uh, for STEM Grambling, powered by Sodexo Magic. And Magic has made a 10-year commitment with his food service company to provide the food at Grambling. But as part of that commitment, I got Magic to sign a million-dollar deal so that we can bring STEM to rural Louisiana and North Louisiana. So, Brian, we built a model that we can license to colleges to help colleges get their technical and human capital off of the damn campus and into the community. We're doing it in New Orleans. I sit on Xavier University campus. We engage Xavier Dillard and Southern University and even Tulane students. Uh, we're, we're about to do it with Southern University. We've signed a licensing agreement with the University of Illinois. We're gonna create STEM Illinois. The University of Illinois We're gonna take this model and engage people all over uh, the state of Illinois with their college students. And that's why I built the model first, because I was a college professor and I just saw that we were not doing what we should be doing in the community. So when they kicked me out of Tulane, I was like, hey, thank you, God. Let's go make this work. So what you see is a STEM fest. We come to communities with a 32 foot truck. We transform an entire arena and we invite the entire community in. What you see there is 60 different stations of STEM. We have a 20 by 30 drone cage that we put in the middle. And imagine when these little kids come in, they've heard about drones, but now they get to fly drones. They've heard about virtual reality, but they get to participate in it. They've heard about robotics, but they get to play with humanoids. So what you saw was that was before, and that's when we had up with a 1,200 people that day on Gramlin's campus. And the president of Gramlin, my friend Rick Gallo, he stood in the middle and he said, Mackie, this is unbelievable. 
He said, we don't have a drum line. I said, not only do you, you don't have a drum line, you don't have a band, you don't have twerking, and yet and still the people came out because the entertainment for the day wasn't a GSU a drum line or the cheerleaders or the football team, it was them. And what this shows is that there's a thirst in our community for this. And if we bring it to the people and show them and give them access, they will respond. Now, I bring this picture up because we had a big computer science program this summer. Uh, we had up to 200 kids in a computer camp uh, in partnership with Chevron, in partnership with a company called UB Tech. UB Tech is the largest commercial robotic builder in America. And we put two, over 200 uh, low income, low resource kids uh, in a computer camp and had them doing uh, programming and making humanoids. This young lady in this picture is why STEMNOLA exists. This lady in this, this young lady in this picture is the reason why this model must be in every community in America. This young lady, her name is Anala. And at the age of four, Anala was attested, was tested and admitted into Mensa. They said her IQ is, is greater than Einstein. And when I met Nala, Anala when she was five years old, I made a promise to her parents. I say anything she wants educationally, she got. If she want a computer, she got it. If she want a robot, she got it. I remember she had gotten into bugs. And they said, Doc, she's really in the bug. I went down to the uh, uh, what is that? An the plant with the animal thing downtown, the insectarium. And I bought everything I could find at the insectarium and brought them to her house. Because you know why, Brian? If she was a five-year-old black boy who ran a 4240, like Leonard Fournette was when we saw him at five years old, they would have been alumni from UGA, alumni from Georgia Tech, alumni from Michigan doing everything they can to give her tennis shoes, to give her uh, her own personal coach. Nike would have been sending her damn shoes. We got to mine the talent in our community, find them where they are, and make sure that they're never in need of the things that they need to develop their mind. I say we either training our kids from the neck down or the neck up. If we training our kids from the neck down, we're preparing them to compete against the automatic machine, the, the slave of the 21st century, a battle that they cannot win. Any, any labor that competes against slave labor must suffer the consequences of that competition. And so we got to train our kids from the neck up such that the robots don't control them, but that they can control the robot. Anala going to be all right. I'm sending Anala to every camp at every college every summer. And our parents hearing about Anala and they bringing their babies to us like, where should my baby go? We got deals with Michigan. We got deals with Purdue. College is now saying, Mackie, can we get those little kids out of you? Yeah, if you pay me, if you, you know, let, let's get an MOU. You no know, education, they like MOU. Let's get an MOU. Because I got I, I got a value proposition for you. This talent acquisition. So you make a donation to that high school to get that black boy playing football. You got to make a donation into our program and become a, a viable partner in my community to have access to our talent so I can develop more talent and we can find the other knowledge and give Anala everything she wants. So Anala, man, Anala is in the eighth grade now. By the time Anala in the ninth grade, next summer she will be teaching the, uh, 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 coding and Python to like third and fifth graders. Now, a lot of things I showed you was pre-COVID. When COVID hit, they shut the country down on March 13th. On March 14th, we were supposed to have five events in three states. Brian, on March 14th, 13th, I had 41 people on payroll. That Monday, March 16th, we lost $45,000 that, that Saturday. Payroll was that Monday. On Monday, I set 41 people down. And I said, they say if you got a nonprofit and you can... Uh, meet your operating budget. If you got 90 days of operating budget in the bank, you're in the top 10% of all nonprofits in the country. And those 41 people sitting at the table, I told them, I don't know how long this is going to last, but I got you for the next 41 days. I mean, for the next 90 days. And for the next six weeks, I said, I need y'all to do what I'm telling you to do. My people went out and we started to develop all this, all these activities. And then we just got up online and we created our own little studio and we just started doing free STEM lessons all across the country. And we put those lessons online and parents could download the stuff. And we, we built all these activities around household products. And during the middle of COVID, at one point, we was engaging up to 750 kids on Thursdays in 34 states and four countries. As a matter of fact, I said we are engaging kids in Tanzania today. Every Thursday, we engage kids in Ghana because they saw us on social media. And now in Ghana, the pictures to the left, these are kids outside 
making the hearts and other things that we now ship with them. And we, we now upload our content and the kids in Ghana and Tanzania download the videos when they can't get on live and actually do the activities that we're doing here in the States. This young lady in the picture, I put her picture up there because this young lady is from rural Alabama. She was a sophomore at Alabama. Her name is, uh, she was a sophomore at Xavier University when she walked into my office one day with a backpack on her shoulder. And she said, I heard, she said, you know, do y'all give out jobs here? I said, what you need a job for? She said, I need to pay for school. The mom started working for me as a sophomore. By the time she was a senior, she was going to Miami once a month in, in leading STEM events. Imagine that, are you, you're a college student, you get to go to Miami and get paid? Yeah, I know she was having fun, but after she, she did that, literally, she started leading her own STEM events for a nonprofit down in uh, Miami that was, that was taking care of us. She was trying to get into men's school. She had some MCAT scores. She started working for, uh, she was still getting her masters. But for five years, Lamar has been leading events for STEM NOLA. And this is why this is so important. She needed to get her MCAT scores up. I said, what is happening? She said, I don't know what's wrong with the test. She said, I really, I said, you need to take one of them courses. And she said, yeah, I can't afford this. How much is the course? She said, $4,000. I said, you have not because you asked not. And STEM NOLA paid for her to get, take a, a Princeton review course. And Lamar now got interviews all across the country for med school. Lamar now make nearly $40,000 as a graduate student working for STEM NOLA. Lamar outworked any professional we have in our organization. And she just had an a, a interview uh, at a med school and the med school said, you way beyond most people that even come to get a medical degree based on your experience. The only thing you need to do is get the degree. You're the type of person we're looking for. What we've done by creating this community-based ecosystem, Brian, we've created a place. I believe everybody's reachable, teachable, and redeemable where our kids can come, engage in their communities, make mistakes, and we correct them before we send them out into the world to be chopped up. Uh, I never forget there was a kid named Scooter. I fired Scooter. Two days later, I show up at, at work and Scooter in the back, you know, sewing again. Now when I just said Scooter, didn't I tell you don't come back here? And Scooter never stopped working. I fired Scooter about two months later. <laughs> Scooter came back. I mean, I fired Scooter three times. I said, this is it, you're done. But the bottom line is that Scooter knew there was a place where he can always come and be accepted. And when I cursed him out and got rid of him the last time, he knew that he had really messed up and I meant it from my heart. And any, any institution is bigger than anybody. So just to show you a little about our revenues, my wife and I started this with $100,000 out of our own pocket. And I say that because a lot of times we want to work for the community, but we refuse to invest in the community. Somebody told me once, they said, you run your mouth a lot, man. It was at, at National Science Foundation. They said, if you believe in your model so much, don't you go damn do it. And I was in a barbershop where I used to go with Master P. And I was in there talking about, man, I'm going to get this grant and I'm going to do this. And the whole barbershop lost it. They said, that's what's wrong with you educated fools. Y'all waiting on the government. You sound like the rest of those hands you've had, Mackie, waiting on the government. And my barber, who I grew up with, he said, you know, look at P, look at cash money. He said, if you believe in what you're doing, take it to the community. If it's real, the community will respond. He said, now I don't want to hear nothing else about it. I left out of there with my tail between my legs. And three weeks after that, I called him and I called, I cursed him. I said, you blankety, blankety, blankety. I said, come to Joe Brown Park on Saturday. And we had 200 kids in that gym doing, doing STEM. And ever since that, the community has responded. Ever since then, I got dope boys. Hey, bro, say, look, Maggie, I know, bro, just take this cash. What you're doing for the kids, just keep doing. People coming from everywhere going, look, this is absolutely amazing. We started with 100000 of our own dollars. Uh, we're projecting over $4 million next year. Uh, this year, we got it at, at, at 300000 I mean, at $3 million. This year, we'll do uh, approximately $2 million in revenue. We got this at $3 million because... Uh, we just got that million dollar a year grant from the Department of Defense. And when we look at the 2020 numbers that I presented to my board yesterday, we're going to do $2 million this year, and nearly a million dollars will be in earned revenue. So we are absolutely sustainable. Along the way, we've picked up some partners, the corporate partners. Uh, I should take Capital One off there. Their logo too big. I told them that the other day. If you don't give me, no, you don't give me some more money, we're going to have to take your name off here. I'm going to go tell them, Mayor. Uh, 
that, that's how they play. That's how we play. If you want your brand in the community to show people you're giving back, hey, $10,000 ain't going to do it, especially when you're giving that white organization over there $100,000 a year. What is it about them? That little white girl had a degree in sound from Loyola University and started a little STEM program trying to teach girls in the STEM. A black man with a PhD get $10,000 and you give her $100,000. And that's why we got to have sustainability because the people giving the money are going to give the money to the people. Otherwise, maybe they got a better relationship with who look like them. And again, we just want a $3 million grant uh, to expand this model from New Orleans all the way along the Gulf Coast. We're going to create STEM Gulf Coast. So we're going to create STEM uh, Biloxi Gulf Port, STEM Pensacola and STEM uh, Panama City Beach. And we're going to create STEM Alexandria and STEM Shreveport and military connected communities, not military connected families, but in those communities. And Brian, this is why we got to talk because when we go in those communities and we start giving kids STEM in the school system. Say, what else do you have? That's why everybody on here, we need to get together. Then what else do you have? And I can call you, I can call people and say, that's the expert. That's the expert in urban education. You need to be talking to them. Stop listening to that foolishness from the curriculum company. These are the people that's doing the work and know how to reach these kids. So, uh, in closing, we reached 50,000 kids from over 1,300 schools, engaged 1,500 STEM professionals and college students. Like I said, we put a million dollars in the hands of college students, engaged over 12,000 families, mostly from underserved communities. Uh, and we even do professional development for teachers because now one of the biggest problems we had, teachers was coming to our events, stealing our kits and our activities. So they would go back to school and say, why are we not doing what this cat doing in the community? And granted, I'm not an educator. So, if, you know, if you say curriculum and you start talking about scaffolding and using all those big words, I don't want to even talk about it. Only thing I know is that this is the way we give kids STEM. Now I've hired a director of education. So she's wrapping that and all that language so the schools can better uh, digest it. And, uh, and, and now they're buying our stuff. Now, this is the future. One of our partners is Auctioner Health System. Auctioner Health System is the largest nonprofit uh, health system in, in the state of Louisiana. Uh, recently, Auctioner has donated to STEM NOLA a 42,000 square foot building in New Orleans East uh, that has over 90,000 residents. That's 5% Vietnamese, 2% white, and 93% black. This building sit on the interstate and we're going to create one of the largest innovation hubs, or, or the largest innovation hub, STEM innovation hub in the hood for our, our children. And we hope educators like you and families around the country will come to this place to be exposed to the 21st century. I got to raise $10 million to do this. I was in a meeting the other day, and the guy said, what you think it'll take? I said, it'll take you know, 7.5 to 10 million, I had the estimates. He said, this say 7.5. I said, well, I think 10. He said, why 10? I said, because it's 7.5 to redo the building. I'm going to need 2 million just to put in there uh, to do what, it, what we need to do for the community. I said, having a pretty building, that's universities. They like that. We got to make sure what's on the inside is what our people need. So I need another 2 million. We talked some more. He said, how are you going to sustain this? I said, within a two hour radius of New Orleans, there's 400 schools nearly 750,000 kids in those schools. I said, if we have two field trips a day, 50 kids per bus, $20 per kid, that's $1,000 a bus, that's $2,000 a day. I said, this is, this is done. We can do this. He looked at me. He said, you got everything you need. He said, now you keep fundraising. But if you need 10, you got 10. Now, if you raise five, I'm going to write a check for five. If you raise nine, I'm going to write a check for one. I said, if I raise nine, I need that five. He bust out laughing. I said, no, I need the five. He said, well, if you raise nine, why you need five? I said, because I told you I need 10 million for the building. I said, I need $5 million for an endowment. He said, $5 million endowment will pull at least minimum $250,000 a year off. I said, I only need that $250,000 to take care of this building so that my children, children, children will have somewhere to come and learn about the possibilities of the 21st century. Brian, we're going to do this. I know y'all saw the movie Black Panther. 
when the Black Panther was over, they said they was gonna build a STEM center in every damn community. And 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 Warner Brothers gave somebody called me, and they, they gave you know ten million dollars towards STEM. I said, ain't we happy? They gave us the crumbs off the table, and we happy. They said, what you mean, Mackie? Nobody can make you happy. I said, man, look, the movie grossed one point five billion. They spent more than you know. They, they committed a million to STEM. I said, they they spent more at the damn a party celebrating a billion than a million they gave us for STEM. Mark Morial, my friend was clapping. I wrote Mark, said, stop clapping for that. He said, Mackie, look, you gotta be appreciative. I said, look, they said they're gonna give us a million dollars for STEM. And he said, some of that money coming to New Orleans. I said, right. I said, they really said that money was going to eight different cities. He said, that's right, and you should be happy. I said, now let's do the math because STEM taught me critical thinking. If you take that, one, that million dollars that, that Marvel gave up for STEM and you divide it by eight, that's $125,000 per city. And they said, okay, Mackie, we're going to get that money to Boys and Girls Club. Well, you know what? There's 4,000 Boys and Girls Club across America. That's $250 per Boys and Girls Club. They said, no, but it, only the Boys and Girls Club, no eight cities. I said, all right, that's $125,000 per city. There's five Boys and Girls Clubs in New Orleans. You divide that 125000 by five, that's $25,000 a club. You can't do a damn thing with that. And don't talk to me when I'm going to put up 100000 of my own dollars. You just made a billion and you sent a million our way. We got to challenge people. What Dr. Love said, I almost lost my mind during that keynote. We got to dismantle the system. We got to challenge the system. And we got to build what we need to show them what they should be doing for our children. Thank you all for listening. Oh, Mackie. Oh, Calvin Mackie. Hey, man. So I, I'm going to, I think we have time for questions. We have about 15 minutes and I want to open it up for questions. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, but, you know, I, I, people are inspired by your vision and for your work. And uh, so I'm going to say, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A. Uh, please put them in the Q&A, actually. It'd be easier for me just to know where they're, 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 they're there. Um, so one of the things I think is important to talk about, Calvin, and you and I were talking about this earlier, is that you're doing this work in New Orleans. Context, I think, is very important for the work that you're doing. You're doing this in New Orleans. Out of all the cities that you could have chosen, you chose New Orleans. And of course, you choose it because it's your home. And I think that also speaks, because I think that as somebody that came out of the city of New Orleans, you approach life in a certain way. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's also part of why and how you work. But can you talk a little bit about why New Orleans, the context of New Orleans is so important to this work. Hey, Brian, one, again, man, you know, I, I admire you. You know, I love you, bro. Uh, thank you for this conference and thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for the commitment to our children. Uh, you know, I wasn't, you know, that's a very important question because you remember I came to Atlanta and I said, I said, the hell with New Orleans, I'm going to leave. And every month for 12 months, I took my family to Atlanta looking for a house. I said I was going to move. And I sat down at a guy's house in Atlanta, one of my mentors from Georgia Tech. He said, man, what, what the hell wrong with you? Why are you looking to move to Atlanta? Because I said, I'm going to do this, man. I got this idea and I'm going to do this. And he said, look, but, you know, what you have been through in New Orleans? Uh, what New Orleans have been through, any solution you come up with, New Orleans deserve it. He said, to pull off what you're saying you're going to try to pull off, you need social capital and political capital. And he said, if you come to Atlanta, it's going to take you a, a, another lifetime, if not two lifetimes, to do that. He said, you need to go your blankety, blankety butt back to Atlanta, to New Orleans, go into your community and bloom where you are. He said, New Orleans is big enough to be considered a city, but it's small enough for you to get your arms around. And he said, if you do this in New Orleans and you get your arms around, he said, you will never get your arms around Atlanta. He said, if you get your arms around New Orleans and you show that you can engage an entire city, Atlanta, Detroit, LA, and everybody else will come. And that's what's happening. So the fact that New Orleans doesn't have Fortune 500 corporations, we got one Fortune 500 corporation. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, companies and corporations. We got high levels of, 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 of poverty. Uh, we got high levels of, of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 of people who don't have 21st century skills. And we're able to pull this off is absolutely remarkable. And it shows that if we present what we need to present in a way that the common man can digest, you can move them. I don't care what you say. There's a book called Tribe, and Seth Golden, G-O-D-I-N, wrote that book. Just Google Golden, uh, Seth Golden and Tribe, and look at the quotes. 
What Donald Trump was able to do was that he found his tribe and he spoke in such a way with a language as ignorant as it may be that resonated with, with, with those so-called disaffected people. Uh, and that's what we have to do. We have to be able to go find our tribe, speak to them and drive them. And now that's why I talk about Lamar going to Miami. That's why I'm talking about Illinois. We've taken this model other places and a model that we've built, the narrative that we've created, the language that we use, it resonate, it resonate with the people. And that came out of New Orleans, because Brian, you know, you know, it's, I'm about it, about it. You know, I'm the man right chair. You gotta be able to talk to the people with chair. <laughs> That's right. And I think, you know, and there is something very special about the city of New Orleans and the people that come out of New Orleans. So Calvin, one of the things I've always respected about you, and one of the things you've always challenged me to think about is, hey, you know what, where are the pieces here that you are missing, that you are not thinking about, that are actually getting in the way of you being successful? Um, and I've seen you do that over and over and over again. And that's why I think in seven years, in seven years, I think it's important to recognize seven years, Tim Nola has grown from an idea to where it is today. And that's absolutely amazing. There's a question in, in the chat, Calvin. It, it says, as we navigate structures in the academy and aspire to do this work, how can how can we build capacity and support organizations like STEM NOLA to sustain this work? <clears throat> so I used to be in the academy. And um, so in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, I told you Tulane ended its engineering program. I come home, I got five people living in my house. One of them is my dad. My dad uh, was a roofer. He was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, the week before Hurricane Katrina, uh, after Hurricane Katrina, it took us six weeks to get him back in the system. Uh, by the time he got him back in the system, the cancer had spread to all over his body. And, you know, I, my daddy was in my house. I had lost my job, my whole family, eight people in my house looking at me. You know, but I, my, my pastor called me when they put on the news, Dr. Mackey, Tulane Indian Engineer, and Dr. Mackey lost his job. I called my pastor and he was laughing. I said, what you laughing about, man? He said, I see you lost your job. I said, you find that funny? He said, you don't? I said, no, man, I got eight people in my house. My daddy died. He said, God, and I answered your prayer. Now you mad? He said, I heard your prayer. You used to pray all the time. God, do you want me to teach 50 kids a semester of 500 a day? He said, the only thing God did for you was that you didn't have the courage to do for yourself. And I hung the phone up on him. <laughs> <laughs> I hung up on him, Brian. And I say that to say this. For the people in the academy, we, we got a partner. That's why I said, you know, they are grassroots organization in your community that otherwise you can support and partner with and bring them to a whole nother level just based on the knowledge and the access that you have because you, you're in the academy. A lot of the time, so many of us in the academy are so detached from the community that we just end up talking to ourselves at a conference like this rather than talking to the people in, in the community. So. The fact that I was in the academy, the fact that I'm in the community, now I have built a model that can serve as a bridge. And that, that was the ultimate goal. When I was a professor, how do I build a, a collaborative bridge with the academy so that when you're at the academy trying to get tenure, trying to be the scholar that you need to be and that we need, you will have a pathway to come into the community and be accepted and give to the community your expertise. The challenge is a lot of times we come to these academies and, and, and we're not of that community and there's no pathway. So there's black professors here and they tell me, man, thank you. Cause they can come out to STEM NOLA and be accepted. And I introduce mm -hmm. them to people and, and, you know, and people embrace them because that's why that doctor day was so great because all those doctors are not from New Orleans and the doctors just want to give back to the community. So now we've created an environment where the academics, where the doctors, where, where, where the educated, you know, can come and B, also we've created a pathway, you know, your time, your talent, and your treasure. And I, I beat my friends up. I'm like, look, man, if you ain't going to give me no money, I don't want to talk to you. Get, get, get off the phone. I got all, I got friends now, you know, vice chairman of corporations and stuff. What, what is it now? now? One of my friends, vice, vice chairman of a corporation, me and him talking. I said, do I need to call the only white person that's over you? Mm. Do I need to call the one white person that's over you to get your company to support what I'm doing. And you've been knowing me all my life, sucker. So the bottom line is, you know, find organizations in your community to plug into, 
And in STEM, a lot of times people, that, that's not who we are. You know, since I was the only black professor at Tulane, I spent a lot of time over in uh, African American, uh, the African American uh, Studies Department, because that's where the five, other five black people were. <laughs> so you got to find where you can plug in and then you can take what you're doing in a department or in your area and then use it. And, and some things, you know, it's not going to be about the academy. It's going to be about this is what I want to do. And that's the battle I had at Tulane. Tulane didn't value me working in the community. So the hell with it. I value my community over Tulane and I never stopped. Got another question from the chat. What words of wisdom would you give to young black people who want to make a change in their community with majority of the of the odds against them? Stop listening to the person who tell you that the majority of the odds are against you, first and foremost. Uh, <laughs> go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. Uh, everybody ain't happy about the work that I'm doing. And my point is hell with them. Uh, I do my politics by addition. So therefore, the, 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 the hardest audience for me to speak to about this is middle-class black people. Because middle-class black people think they know. All right, they may be doctors, maybe lawyers, and they got their kids over in some private school. And I told one of my buddies, he brought his kid to my program, my program, if you don't get free lunch, it's $75 per kid, right? And he's like, man, that's $225. I said, you don't, you don't, I said, them kids go to their private school, that's at least 45,000. They go to the private school, I bet you they never met a black PhD in engineering, and you ain't complaining about that 45000 I said, for like $225, your kid's getting something a day that they, they, they don't get all year, and that damn uh, 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 culturally challenged environment you put them in. So therefore, now we, we're getting low-income, low-resource kids on the news. You can go to STEM NOLA YouTube channel. Every week, we put a kid on the news, and the kid explains stuff. And we're... We go to STEM NOLA, and STEM NOLA YouTube and Google, like STEM NOLA PSA. We released two commercials with black kids on it during the Saints game. I went to the news channel, and the guy said, well, you know, Mackie, you know, this, this stuff costs. I said, I said, what make you think I ain't here to pay for it? Hmm. Well, I ain't mean it like that. Yeah, you meant it like that. Well, you know, man, the commercial during the Saints Atlanta game, we hate them dirty birds. We hate them, 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 them Atlanta Falcons. He said, man, that's the largest watch game of the night. I said, I want to run a commercial. He said, well, that'll be $50,000. I said, let's do it. He said, if I was on your board, I wouldn't do that. But you know what? You ain't on my board. And then he felt bad. He said, well, I'll tell you what. If you're going to do it, I'll meet you halfway. So it, it'll be 25 for you. I said, no, sucker. You said 50. So let's let's run a minute. I want a minute for $100,000. He's like, well, you know, to make a long story short, we did that commercial. Brian, I used to be a professor. In 1999, I wrote a paper called Promoting a Study of Science, Math, Engineering, and Technology Using Video Programming in Urban Districts. If you remember, National Science Foundation had a grant called Urban Systemic Initiatives. I tried to get the USI to pay for it, and they wouldn't pay for it. And this is why you can't give up on your dream. 20 years later, to that person who's struggling, who need motivation, when the odds are against you, I wrote that paper in 1999 and nobody listened to me. In, in, in 19, I mean, in 2019, Thanksgiving night, I ran that commercial on TV. Took me wow. 20 years, cost me $50,000, and I raised over half a million dollars over the next uh, eight weeks because I ran that commercial. Chevron, who's sponsoring our STEM Saturday today, they had promised never to sponsor me because I talked to them just like I talk like this. They said, you'll never get money from us. When they saw that commercial on TV, guess who was calling me that Tuesday? She thought the train had left the station. This fool in the pool is off and we ain't on it. My boss gonna be asking why we ain't supporting that STEM organization. So now I get $100,000 a year from it. I love them now, we, we best of friends. <laughs> so my point is, stop listening to the naysayers. That's right. Follow the dream that's in your heart, even if it costs you everything. Many people look at me and they say, man, you know, you run your mouth. Do you ever wonder what it cost you? I say no, because I'm too busy celebrating what it, what it got me. And what it got me is, is a peace of mind. There's no softer pillar than a clear conscience. And I get up every day doing the things that I believe God has put in my heart to do, working with our children, and more importantly, making the money I would have made in the academy. So I'm all good. 
have one more question for you, sir. And it's, uh, I think it's a nice one to end on uh, because I, I, one of the things I love about sources, the people that we, we get in the conference, these are people that want to do work that, that you're doing, want to collaborate, want to build. So there's a question that says, how can we help? How can we donate? How can we participate? So uh, can you let them know? Hey, look, man, I'm enjoying it so much, but I'm gonna put out so much here. I mean, this is just, but but I'm gonna send you an invoice, bro. You gotta pay for this. I'm sorry, Brian. I gotta send you that. <laughs> so, <laughs> checks in the mail, sir. Checks in the mail. <laughs> so the point, no, this, this is how you help. You can go to stemnola.com. We have a donate button. I say this in New Orleans all the time. I go out, and you know, in New Orleans, we got little boys and people like Mac at the work you're doing. Let me buy you a drink. I said, no, man, don't buy me a drink. I could buy my own drink. How about you give me ten dollars a month? I said, if you give me, if you just let, if you give me ten dollars a month, one drink a month, bro. We, can, you know, at hundred twenty dollars, that's two. I mean, that's two. That's two sessions, bro. I said, if ten thousand people in New Orleans give me ten ten dollars a month, if the twelve thousand people we've engaged just commit to ten dollars a month, I never have to ask anybody for anything. So, if you want to donate, go to stemnola.com and you can donate, and we take whatever. Uh, uh, we our our program is audited every uh, every year. Uh, the audits posted for people to see. Uh, I believe as a black led organization, people are gonna come look under the hood. I videotape everything and put online because we've been hustled so much that we think everything is a hustle. So uh, you can donate at stemnola.com. But you know, a lot of times right now, I was so happy when Brian called me. Because now when we build that 42,000 square foot building, that's where we got to come together. That's where we got to create our think tank. That's where we got to put our heads together. That's why we got to see these things. Brian, I'm looking forward to you coming here and doing uh, teacher trainings. Uh, you know, we don't have to ask people permission now to do and be what it is we, we need to be and need to do. So we definitely take donations. We want to start something I call STEM NOLA Fellows because the weakest part of our program, and Brian noticed in STEM, the weakest part of any STEM program is 9th through 12th graders. So like Anala is in the 8th grade, we're about to create STEM NOLA Fellows. So we're going to give these kids $1,000 a year stipend, but we're going to mentor them, right? And if they want to be a doctor, we're going to get them a doctor. And we're going to have up to at least 50 cohorts, I mean 50 students in a cohort per year, and just, just have them moving along. Now imagine this. I went to the men. The men say, I love it. And this is why the men loved it, because I said, man, four years, if you fund 50 kids a year, after four years of being mayor, after four years, you're going to have your name on 200 of the brightest minds in New Orleans. Our eyes got big. See, I'm with that. And you, you have to know the language of politicians and what moves them. So we, we take our event, we move it around the city to a different council district every month so people ain't mad. Or council people come out. And if they don't like it, the hell with them. We got the people. You know, one thing Barack Obama proved when he beat Romney is that organized people beat organized money every time. And that's why I went to Michigan and looked at uh, community organizing so I can organize the community around STEM. So time, talent, treasure. Sign up for our newsletter. If you want to fly down and volunteer, we welcome. Come on. Uh, if you want to donate, donate uh, and tell somebody about what we're doing. Yeah, and I, and I saw people, I got, I see Natalie King's in the room, one of our, our science educators here at State that's doing some amazing work. So I, I do hope. So please, let's support, let's support STEM NOLA. Uh, you know, if, if nothing else today, at least tweet out, put it on your social media that you heard Calvin Mackey speak and he inspired you to think differently. Link over, hashtag STEM NOLA, hashtag Source of 2020. Let's let people know about the good work that is being done so we no longer have to run to other people to support our children in our communities. Brian, um, can I say something else? Yeah, for, yes. for these science educators. So in New Orleans, you know, the school district, they buy, they buy these, they call it tier one curricular, right? So the, the, the curriculum is certified by the state, and then you only can buy that curriculum. So I tried to sell them my curriculum. They wouldn't sell me my curriculum. So you know what I did, bro? I went to the best charter school in New Orleans and they hired the curriculum specialist. You know, former TFA, former Ivy League. I said, come with me. And then we looked at the, the tier one curriculum and we found all the gaps. And then we took STEM NOLA stuff and we wrote curriculum to fill in all those gaps. <laughs> you know, so 
to you science educators, I want us to be rich. I want us to get what's due us based on our knowledge. There's so much that we can work together on. Right. I don't know curriculum, but now these teachers are coming over. They're like, oh, you, what you got is great. I see, well, well, make it right, make it right. Let's make it right, stir that up so we can go sell it to the state. You should be getting paid for your expertise. And that's what I'm saying, we bring our head together. We could create things that otherwise we could bring to the marketplace. I mean, if everybody else getting rich off the education, why we can't? When we, when we know how to do it, we know how to engage the kids, we got products that we're giving away. No, if they want our products, they should be buying them too. I agree. I agree. Calvin, man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I've known you for a while. I remember coming out and coming to Tech right out of Norfolk State to start working on my PhD and, and connecting with you there. And so I know this is Stem, Stem Nola is seven years old, but I know you've been doing this work and you've been impacting people's lives for much, much longer. So I appreciate everything that you do, sir. I appreciate the person that you are. Thank you so much for sharing your genius with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And we will, we will commit to continuing to support Stem Nola and the work that you're doing down there in New Orleans. Thank you so much, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, man. Thank you Brian. Y'all have a great one. All right. And please, you all put some love for Dr. Dr. Mackey and Stem Nola in the chat, but more, more importantly, support this organization. Please support this very important organization. Hey, Brian, are y'all going to be able to give me those comments? Because I can't send. We sure can. We and sure my, can. My email just cmackey, cmackey at stemnola.com. And, the, and the, the web address for uh, Stem Nola? Stemnola.com. There you go. All right. We like Thank two props. We ain't hard to find, baby. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. All right, folks, we are going into a 15 minute break. And, and so, you know, we have worked out the technical issues that were bugging us earlier in the day. The evening concurrence, the afternoon concurrence are ready to go. So we will not have any problems there. Please, like I said, give some love to Dr. Mackey and to Stem Nola. Thank you again, Calvin. Thank you, everybody that participated in this. Please uh, go out if you're on social media, Sources 2020, Stem Nola, uh, hashtag Stem Nola. Please give us some love. And, uh, and we'll see you in about 15 minutes for our next session to the 15th Annual Sources of Urban Educational Excellence Conference. I'm Brian Williams. I'm director of the CRIM Center here at Georgia State, the uh, organization that hosts this conference every year. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited that you're here uh, for this particular panel. Uh, like I mentioned in my opening, this, this conference was created by Dr. Asa Hilliard and Dr. Susan Krim McClendon to be a space uh, for anybody and everybody to speak their truth with regards to excellence in urban education. And every year, every year, we have had uh, young people to present its sources because Dr. Hilliard and uh, Dr. Krim McClendon both believe that our young people are the ones who are most immediately affected by our schools and our public education system. And as a, as a result, they have a specific consciousness about what needs to be in our schools and what needs to be happening. So today we're joined by a panel of young people that are a part of the Algebra Project and the Young People's Project here well, in Florida and in Baltimore. If you're unfamiliar with uh, both these organizations, the Algebra Project comes out of the work of Dr. Bob Moses. I would encourage you to go read his book, Radical Equations, if you wanna learn more about his work in the civil rights movement and also his work uh, with the Algebra Project. But today we're going to focus on these young people, and we are fortunate enough to have a moderator, uh, Nautica Jenkins, uh, who is from Project South, who is going to be our moderator for this session. I'm going to introduce Nautica, and she's going to introduce our panelists. So Nautica, Nautica Jenkins is a Youth Speak Truth radio show producer at Project South here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Project South is the Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide. Youth Speak Truth is a radio program that airs bi-weekly on WRFG here in Atlanta, which is a nonprofit community radio station that provides a platform for young voices. She has been working for Project South through their youth organizing program for a little over five years. So Nautica, we are so appreciative of your willingness to come and share a bit of what you know and a bit of your genius with us today and to lead this very important panel of uh, young activists and organizers who are leading new movements around equity and excellence in public education today. So thank you for being here. I'm gonna give it, floor is yours. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for that awesome intro. And greetings, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I 
am super excited to be here today. Even more excited to hear from our three amazing panelists. Um, I I don't know what else to say. I'm just super excited. Um, and to start, uh, students are expected to participate in education from K-12 for nearly 40 plus hours a week, yet most of us never stop to think to ask students what is or isn't working. Decision makers don't know what's happening on the ground and in the communities that will feel the effect of their decisions. Today, these awesome young people will be sharing their analysis on our current education system. They will also be sharing their vision for the future of education for young people and how they've been working on the ground to see that vision become reality. Before we do that, I want to take some time to introduce these three amazing panelists. Um, Jonathan Gray is an 18 year old youth organizer with the Baltimore Algebra Project, which is a youth led nonprofit grassroots organization, and he's been doing it for going on five years now. John's organizing took off post the two, 2017 Free Minds, Free People Conference. Since then, he has been able to bring organizing and what he's learned to schools and other organizations alike. Next, we have Selena Allen, who is currently a senior at Hallandale High School. She plans on going to college to obtain a bachelor's degree in social work. Early in her education journey, she struggled to fully understand great year where she met her math teacher, Ms. Cassetto. She credits Ms. Cassetto and the Algebra Project for her success in math. She's also a member of YPP or Youth uh, Young People's Project, where she tutors other students to be efficient in math. And lastly, we have Giovanni Williams, who was born and raised in Jamaica and is currently a senior at Hallandale High School in Broward County, Florida. He migrated to the United States in hopes of a better learning environment. However, throughout middle school, he struggled a lot, especially in math. He started doing the bare minimum in order to move on to high school. When he got to high school, he found himself focused only on football. During a practice the summer before his ninth grade year, the coach at Hallandale insisted that he enrolled in Algebra Project Summer Induction Academy where he would go to meet a group of young youth matter, uh, young math literacy workers in the Young People's Project. Here, he truly grew to enjoy and learn math. This made him want to become a math leadership worker to teach younger students to enjoy math. He plans to continue working with Algebra Project and Young People's Project after starting his college career because he, they helped him excel in math and to become the man he is today. Now he wants to do the same thing for other youth in his community. All right, so with that being said and our panelists being introduced, I wanna kick off with the first question, which is why are youth voices important to the decision-making process of local school systems? Um, and anyone is up to start, who wants to start us off? And Nautica, we, we lost Giovanni, we're gonna get him back on, okay? Thank you, all right. I start with, uh, um, but yeah, so uh, good morning, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, thank everybody again for having me. Um, like Nautica said, uh, I'm John Gray, or I'm Jonathan, but um, to answer the question of like the importance of youth voices, um, it's pretty, you know, it's one of those, it's like a pretty, it's one of those questions that I like, can kind of all know, like, or whatever, but it's like, I mean, we have to. Hear what the young people, you know, are saying because they're going through a lot of the issues that, are, you know, we're going through a lot of the issues, um, or that we're trying to address, like right now in current, you know, situations. It's it's impossible to talk about education or to talk about um, how to better the lives of young people, how to better the, the community without talking about, you know, it's impossible to talk about education without talking about young people. So we definitely got to understand um what school climates are like you need to understand what you know young people what are the different like tropes what are the different things that young people 
um, are experiencing right now so we can really know how to like communicate and talk to the community. It's just um it's just essential. It's just necessary. Um, hi, my name is Selena. Thank you for having me. Um, just like John said, it's like we the ones who are living through the school system and the education system, and we're the ones, you know, who's going through it. Like it's a difference between how education was back then and how education is now. And it's like you can't have people from back then talking, trying to change education when it's not the same. So it's important to have us, you know tell you the problems or things that we see that you know just doesn't go good <laughs> and it's just important that we tell you everything that's happening right now then versus somebody else telling you or an adult telling you and they not living it through like how we are so, yeah thank you thank you um so for this next set of questions um the idea was to move through a format of consciousness vision and strategy what are we aware of right now what do we want to see happen and how do we plan on getting there or what work are we doing to get there so this question i wanted to kind of gauge your your awareness or consciousness around the purpose of education and what role the school should play so what do you think the purpose of education is and it's, I know it's a, it sounds kind of silly because you know, like education you learn, right? But on a deeper level, what is education in the structure of life and also development as a young person? And what role should school play in a student's life? Anybody can step up. Okay. <laughs> I can go again. Um, so um, I would say like for me this is something that like I mean we've talked we uh panels and uh, we talk stuff. Um, I think that uh I think that the when we say like the purpose of education and the purpose of school, I think we kind of get caught up. And somebody has said this, I'm not sure if it was on use, right? but somebody has said it, you kind of get caught up in um a couple subjects and in, like a couple areas, you know, of like development. And we pretty much like even the things that branch out are usually within a certain amount. So like even like the classes that should be normal and should be available to everybody that aren't like art or music, like talent classes, even those classes, when you go to those classes, you learn essentially the same stuff. How to be a singer, how to be a rapper, you know. Um, but it doesn't necessarily say like the full branch or the full um the full extent of what these day where is what these different things can do. So I think when we say like what is the purpose of school, what what should school be, I think it should just be like it should be structured around your know, experiences. You know? It should just offer or present everything that is there and teachers and older people, you know, their roles as their roles should be like guiding roles. You know, I think schools should almost kind of resemble kind of like museums, you know, it's like these are the things that are out there. These are the things that exist. I'm going to teach you as much as we have access to you. There's not going to be any bias. Um, and from your own personal experience and the things that are out there, let us know what you're trying to do and we'll find something that works. And I feel like school kind of now is like, like, you know, like we said, like these are the five or these are the four areas of work. Do what you got to do to get this grade, which doesn't necessarily mean learn, you know, if it's I've had teachers be like, listen, and I mean, and it's weird because it's like to an extent, you know, like these are like the better teachers. These are the teachers that we favor. These teachers that we like to hang with. It's like, all right, listen, if you if you just fill this out, it's a completion grade, you know, and like that's all you got to do. And it's like, in some cases, that's fine. In some cases, it's like it's really just teachers helping students pass. And it's not that there's nothing wrong with that. No. Only certain teachers only got to do that because of the way like it's structured now that a lot of students who deserve to pass don't pass. But even that, like even the even the good that is being done in a situation like that still harms. You know, you, you might not learn what you're supposed to learn exactly. Um, but if we structure school kind of like support guys, you know, kind of like as strictly about helping you do whatever it is that you want to do, um, 
that's I think that's the, I would say that's the way to go. And of course, you know, like in practice, that's going to look different. That might be hard, but um, I say I would compare that to like trade schools or um, you know, like when we talked about it. Um, stuff like that. um I'll come back to it, but um, the point is schools that kind of take off of like the regular framework. Okay, so when I have a question, what is the purpose of education? So it's like, when I think about education, it's important to know, you know, basic knowledge, you know, when you're growing up from preschool, all the way to middle school. I feel like that's basic knowledge. Everything is good there. Like, I learned a lot, you know, growing up from elementary to middle school. You know, you learn everything. Math, how to write, everything. That's good. But when you get to high school, I feel like they should train you on life after high school. Like, I cannot stress that enough. Because like we working and we doing grades, we getting grades, but it's only grades. Like we only working to get the grade. We only working to get an A, a high GPA, to get this, to get that. But what about when we go, when we leave school? What about when we graduate? You, They give us these tests and it's like, we taking a test. What they have to do when we graduate though? Like, okay, I understand like, you know, to test us to see what our knowledge is and stuff like that but i feel like education the purpose of education is to train you on life after school that's i feel like that should be the purpose of education not necessarily just grades and tests i feel like because anybody can get a good grade graduate high school and still not be you know successful in life or still be confused about what's going to happen after high school, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> that's just my purpose of education. Like, <laughs> no, I, I I totally dig that. Like, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, so next question. Um, what is your analysis or your thinking around the shift in education during uh the current coronavirus? Um, more specifically, the big shift to online and remote learning. Any opinions and thoughts on that? So, um, yeah, it's a big difference between in school and online school. It's benefits to online school, of course, but in my opinion, I feel like I succeeded more in regular school. Like, I know my grades are good, you know, online and stuff, but I don't really know what I'm getting back. Like, the teachers are teaching, but what am I getting back when they teach? I, I, I'm just getting a grade back because I'm just filling out the work that they're giving me. I don't know. Like, we sitting on a computer screen, and it's like, I don't have the motivation sometimes to even do my work. And I don't have no friends, you know, socialize with my friends and stuff. And it's just a big difference and a big change how we've been going to school in person. And then now we have to do online. Like, it, it's beneficial, you know, because of COVID and everything. You know, it's beneficial. We don't, nobody want get, to get it. So it's okay. But at the same time, it's hard. And I feel like teachers don't understand how hard it is online. Like, you, you guys know we've been in regular school from preschool, from preschool. Now we have this big change, and it's like, how y'all expect us to, you know, have do 10 different assignments from 10 different teachers? Like, it's hard, and I feel like some teachers know, you know, one of my teachers, like, it's no, um, do they, you know, you guys can complete the assignments when you get it done. I understand that you have assignments from other classes, but then you got some of the other teachers that's like, okay, I'm gonna give you a test. Yeah, we go quiz y'all. Quit, but I don't even know what you were teaching this whole time. Like, you gotta understand it's hard when we online, when we were just in transitional school. Like, 
but I just feel like it's a big difference from online and transitional, and there's multiple things that's different, especially motivation, lack of motivation, lack of wanting to do assignments, lack of teachers teaching, just participation, everything. We just lacking it on online. Don't get me wrong, it's beneficial. We still online, we still learning everything, but it's just a huge difference from transitional school and online school with Corona happening. Um, you know, I definitely agree with what you said. You talked about like, big, um, the big shift, you know, coming from never really doing virtual learning or never having to do anything fully virtual. Um, I think, like, for me, the biggest part of it, though, is kind of it's kind of like a bittersweet. Um, I think it's good that we're doing virtual learning because I personally, you know, I'm all about where you man stay in the house, you know, yeah. but uh, it, well, the things that I would say is that we kind of see, I don't know, to me, it shows how education is really valued in um, the world. I guess I can't speak just for, you know, like, United States, um, but how is really, because, like, when we, you see that, like, the instant that it started becoming an inconvenience to people, everybody was, like, ready to go back to school, kind of, like, this rush to go back, um, but we got to kind of gear ourselves to it. We got to like have like this like safety mindset, you know, and also think it's a matter of like, wow, um, some of the things that I think we were seeing during virtual learning were that a lot of like impoverished communities, a lot of students who don't necessarily got it like that were kind of like, you know, they were, it was like up in smoke for them, you feel me? If we didn't have a device, if we didn't have a hotspot, if you don't have technology, um, a lot of those things were like, if provided, not of great standard, not of great quality, you feel me? Um, and it kind of shows like, and, um, and I think it, I think it helps that the question earlier is kind of, you know, what do you think education is? If we really, if we're really talking about the core root, you know, well, the core root of what I believe education is, right, which is simply making sure that the person, the subject, the person, whatever, knows as much as they can so they're as prepared, you know, for like um, Selena said, life after high school, like the real world, um, what are the things that we value? Um, and uh, with that, it was like, like I know for me, right, um, I spoke earlier about the whole like just doing enough to pass. Um, during virtual learning, it was probably like some of the like easiest classes I've had, you feel me? There were teachers who was just like, all you gotta do is you gotta join the class, you gotta stay until the end, maybe do an assignment, and you would have been, you would have done like a student's day of work. You feel me? And then there were also classes that it was like ridiculous because they were trying to put the amount of, they were trying to put the amount, or they were trying to put what a regular traditional school year would look like and just put it online and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't realistic for students. You know? I think it was necessary. I think what where the shift needs to be made uh, or the shift that could be made to better um, students is kind of like the outsourcing different community organizations and different groups and stuff that know about working with young people and already do, um, already teach, already like assist in that way. You know? um, it's hard to expect a child in like the third grade to kind of just figure out Google Classroom because that's the only option now, you know, that's not realistic. But if we have um, community organizations like YPP, like the Baltimore Algebra mm -hmm. Project that um, are partnering or contracted with schools, if we have more, we have more resources and people. You know I mean? um, and I feel like a lot of those issues would be solved. And really the more resources kind of all comes back to the funding of impoverished schools because me, or in my opinion, the schools that are like hurt the most from virtual learning were the schools that were already underfunded, under under resourced. And those schools were schools with primarily black and brown students. You know? So if we can if we can make that shift into just I mean, we do it in other areas, you feel me? Like there's a hurricane somewhere where we send resources. You know? So there's kind of like a hurricane in education right now where students are kind of being left out. I think we need to flood resources, you know. Um I don't think it's unrealistic to be like 
there's nothing wrong with having a person or, or doing or doing Zoom calls. If I can like talk to my doctor one on one over the call, there's no reason. I know my doctor has other patients. There's no reason I shouldn't be able to talk to my student one on one. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be. You're gonna send your money to what's important. You feel me? And if we can make that shift, that we can, you know. Yeah, if we can make that shift, I think it will better the virtual learning. You know, I definitely don't think the answer is to just kind of send kids like, whether it's one day a week, two days a week. I just don't think that's where we. I don't think that's how we should carry it. Thank you, John. Um, Giovanni, thank you for joining us. You're back. Um, the question that we are tackling right now um what is your analysis on the shift in education during the current coronavirus more specifically um the big shift to online or remote learning any thoughts or opinions i'm sorry um for me the shift was very kind of in the mix like even with me because I felt like I needed a new more a more and a better new learning space because I was kind of getting bored at school because only thing I did I would participate in athletics and I was also the algebra project in between that it was like very hectic a hectic day for me because one side I'm an athlete and the side I'm a full student so but then I realized to my whiteness it was very very harder than I expected it to be. It was a new way for us. It was adapting. It wasn't just getting up. I thought I was just going to get up and go, go, go like I was in school. All of a sudden, like my time just slowed down on me. And then I realized that online learning is very challenging, especially with me working for the Algebra Project where we merged online during this whole pandemic. Teaching kids, we had to come up with new ideas, new ways, new platforms and stuff we had to use. I was my great teammate on here, Selena and that knowledge too it was a very challenging experience like we really had to work together adapt and it's like it was a really great experience for me and it's kind of i don't know i'm just in in the mix with it right now i'm just doing it just going with the flow thank you guys awesome 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 i'm seeing in the chat uh that folks are resonating with your analogy, um, John. Okay, so next question. Uh, if you had an opportunity to change one thing about your local school system, what would it be and why? Um, like I said, one thing I would change is the lack of knowledge after high school like i we need to have more knowledge on what life will be after high school we don't want to hear like about the same careers you know be a doctor firefighter the same veterinarian the same careers we need to know we need to expand the career path and show students different careers they can go into different things they can do if they want to go to the military if they don't want to go to college, what can they do? You know, like we just having kids graduate after high school and they don't know what they're going to do or what they have in mind. They know they don't want to go to college. They know they don't want to go to military. So what can we do? Just get a job. That's it. Maybe like, you know, if people, if like we have other options, can you present them to us? You know, like, it's just because one thing that I struggled with was what I was going to do after high school. You know, I found that on my own. Like, I searched it up and everything. And then I had to think, how many other kids might be struggling with that? How many other kids might not know what they want to do and everything? It's, like, just a big thing. I don't know. That's just my big thing. Like, I want kids to be successful after, you know, school. So I feel like we need more knowledge. One thing I want to change is knowledge after high school. What can we do? What can students do? You know, what can students be? 
that's the one thing I really want to change and that I have my mind set on what to change, if that makes sense. Uh, for me, one thing I would like to change in my school where I'm from is teaching finances, you know, how to manage your bank account, what are all the finances that's going to take on to you right at the high school, because a lot of kids like me rushed into a job. Okay, I'm 16. I see my friends with the newest Jordans. I want to look the coolest. I want to be that guy in school. So I'm like, I rushed into a job. Didn't know what a bank or really know what a bank was because I'm from the Caribbean. I didn't really know what a bank was. I I knew what a bank is, but I didn't know what the gist of it, how to get a checkings account, how to get all of that until I rushed into that job and they look at me and said, okay, what's your account number? What's all of that? And you're like stuck like, oh my God, what is that? I feel like they should teach that more in school, real life things like what are your paths? What's way to go? There's other options. You don't have to go to college or even for people that feel like high school is not for them anymore and they feel like they want to get out and be entrepreneur or as of new age or generation, a YouTuber, Teach them all the stuff. Teach them how, what is the negative effect of that? What is the positive? What could happen? What could not happen? I just feel like school should be more realistic on the realistic side. Because even though they teach you education every day, a teacher may not know unless they care what's going on or what's the gist of it. What, what's your really desire? As my teammates said, they just jam a certain careers in your face and you're like, okay, this is the board. Just see what we have to pick from. They don't tell you that, okay, you can do this instead of that. Or what do you like? What do you, what have your, what are your real dreams are? They told you to write goals down, but what are your real dreams? That's just it for me. School, I just think they should have more realistic classes with people that actually want to teach it, not teachers that you can just push in the classroom and be like, um, okay, I see that you're certified for this. Okay, go do it. Make sure it's passionate teachers that want to do it. That's gonna be hands on with the kids and not just okay, do this and do that. That's just it for me. Um, and I definitely um, things I the thing I think I would add to the city, I'm in Baltimore. So the way it's set up is that we have our school board, um, and we have two young people that sit on a board, but it's kind of iffy. We have a, I think we have about, I, mean, I used to know this number about hard, but it's like two something schools. Um, and about maybe like 15, 20 of them are like recreational. Some are like, um, some are like alternative. Um, but I saw that to say that it's two young people on the board and one, they're outnumbered. Two, the rest of the board votes on what they can and cannot vote on. You feel me? Which to me just doesn't make sense. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't seem fair. Um, and yeah, like yeah, the outnumbered, the rest of the board decides what they can and can't vote on. And then the schools where they usually get their students from is like that top percentage school, you know, where it's not private school, but it's pretty much, you know I me. Mean? It's the schools that they got, um, the schools are, you know, predominantly white students. It's not the schools where students are getting in the fights. It's not the schools where, you know, um, it's not as flashy. There's no, nobody from an alternative school is going to be sitting on the board, um, on the Baltimore City School Board, you feel me? It's going to be like the top of the school. So I would say youth representation, you feel me? An accurate youth representation. There's kind of like, oh, like we all know about tokenism, you feel me? But then there's like this other, you know, aspect of it where it's like, you have young people present, but um, that's my household, on everybody. I'm sorry for you. Um, oh. we it's all good, John. Life is real and it goes on. <laughs> okay. Um, it's all good. <laughs> long, no, nobody else gets. But um, yeah, so like we have, um, yeah, so we have, you know, there's tokenism and then there's like this version of it, it kind of it's kind of hurts to say it but it's like they get young people that like aren't for young people you know what i'm saying they get the kids that's kind of like cool with the stuff that's going on they're just so happy that they're on the board 
that they're not taking the responsibility. It's like, it's my duty to make sure that my peers, their rights are being seen. That's why I'm here. You know, I have a responsibility. And it's like, like, come on, you're supposed to have our back. And you up there just chilling. And it's like, even if they was to be on, you know, the right time and they was to be trying to motivate and move and, you know, shake rooms and stuff, they couldn't because they outvoted. And the board thinks that, and the board decides what they can and can't vote on. So it's like, what is the purpose, you know? So I would say youth representation, and I would say having young people be at the table um, and having them be actual decision makers. You know, there's a difference between like, you're part of the conversation and or like we're telling you about the conversation we have, what do you think? And like real decision makers, like I, I a 35 year old say something and the 10th grader can say to me, no, we don't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? And that's okay. You know, that needs to be normalized. But like some version of that needs to exist. You know? so yeah, I would say youth representation um, and like fair youth representation, fair structure. I would represent my young people. Yeah, I awesome. Thank y'all for that. And uh, we have a comment. Um, it's really hard to read. Uh, but I'll try my best. Um, and it says, I hear people in the call, um, I guess, asking for prep for life after school. It makes sense, but how can we also honor the selves of students as they are in the present? I don't want to negate the people you are here and now, all that you can do in the present and all that you can do in the present. So what I'm hearing from this is that there's a question on how can we honor ourselves as students as we are in right now or as students exist right now. So, yeah, we have thoughts of the future, but how can we, um, I guess, be honest students as they are in this present moment, which is great, a great question because it also leads to our, our last station of this um, we're not last, but this next section, which is strategy or how we're going to move forward. So I guess we can go ahead and uh, I guess if anyone has any comment on that on how to honor um, students as we are right now, or as students are right now, that makes sense to you all. And yeah, okay, so we can go ahead and, and get some feedback on that comment from, uh, from one of our, our attendees. Um, I was taking a few notes, but um, I think, um, well, my understanding of the question is like, like you said, Nautica, and like the um, person said, um, like, you know, like we just, like, yes, you know, learning how to do taxes and stuff eventually is like important. Like, we got stuff going on right now, or like we're still existing right now. And um, some of the some of the notes, like some of the things um, when we talk about strategy or kind of like active resistance is what I'm thinking is um, a couple of things that we exercised in the um, city is, and um, so we have something called the National Student Bill of Rights. Um, and pretty much what that is, is a couple of years ago at a, at a Free Minds, Free People Conference, which is pretty much this um, conference that happens in the United States every, happens somewhere in the United States every other year and different organizations, groups, uh, really anybody can kind of come from across the country um, to wherever it is and kind of talk about the problems back from where they're at. And really people come from outside the country as well, but it's, it's just a conference. But, um, uh, and from those conversations and different exercises and meets and greets and all that other stuff, we come up with some like like-minded strategies and different stuff like that. Um, but the National Student Bill of Rights was some youth organizations and some young people came together and pretty much came up with a list of 16 rights that they feel as though all people are entitled to, all young people are entitled to. And the purpose of the Bill of Rights is constitutional protection of education. Um, and that's a real, like, a real matter of education. You can really be protected so that way there's never going to be, there's never, um, Free minds, free people. Um, 
uh, some people call FMFP, Free Minds, Free People. Um, that's the name of the conference. And so, yeah, so, the, so and the reason why, the reason why we kind of want to, the reason why it's so important to have, you know, constitutional edu protection of education is that we don't see situations in a city where education is cut and the police budget doubles, you know, that doesn't happen. That shouldn't be happening, you know, with NSBR, when we talk about protecting the rights of the young people, protecting the rights of education, um, for young people to come and, you know, just for, yeah, just for education's sake, you know, that doesn't happen. Um, and when I finish talking, I'm actually going to run upstairs and get two things. Um, this is a copy of the, of the ballot and another thing I'm going to talk about. But the other thing, the other thing I would suggest, something that, um, so like in my bio, I mentioned how like I was able to bring stuff I learned to like my high school and stuff. And I said that because last year, something really cool or something I thought was really cool happened where pretty much one of our, um, one of the assist like aides in the building um, was fired because they like a student. It was an altercation with a student, but the point is they was helping the student out. It wasn't, I don't think it was anything inappropriate, but pretty much they got fired for it. And all the kids was kind of like hurt. They was like, why would you, you know, like, why would you do that? And um, the school said that they fired them because the aide like interfered with the person's personal life. But I mean, it was like, and uh, it wasn't helping them, you know what I'm saying? It was like doing all this, but they had a connection with a young person and they helped them just outside of school and it, and they, it, it was inappropriate and they fired. So us as young people, we came together, we got ballots, we got into the whole shabazz and we like, protested you left the school with megaphones and stuff they called like school police on me and they called like real police on me it was like a whole thing with me and my brother um we both worked for the algae project and it was like that's not cool that's not going to slide and the school also had a lot of Baltimore city schools always doing stuff to kids that they should not be doing to kids so this wasn't you know kids was frustrated so we was kind of like trying to yeah we was mad we was going to do something about it um and while the person didn't get reinstated um, it led to this like wave of like eye opening moments for students. So people, we started collecting all copies of like the school handbook. Um, we started going to, we went down to, uh, we went down to uh, school headquarters and we got copies of like the Baltimore city handbook, you know, and we was comparing them like, this is what this says, this is what this says, you know, this stuff not adding up. These things, you know, these things are messed up. And I said, I say all that to say, a couple things. I think we should try to practice in SBA student government, um, and not just being in student government because there's a lot of student governments where like you get in and then that's it. And you know you might plan farewell, you might plan like a prom or something. But I said, get in the SBA, learn like what are the responsibilities and learn the stuff that you guys can do like in contracts, like on paper, and like work from there. Like put you determine what the group is going to be and stuff like that. Um, also, some schools you know practice restorative practice. All these are all of this stuff is stuff that's on paper, like documents that say we're restored to practice, the documents that say what SBA can and can't do. If you find those documents and go to bed at them, you know, you can do those things. And school is either going to do one or two things, either going to fold and they're going to work with you, or they're going to stop like sneaking around and they're blatantly going to tell you, hey, your voice doesn't matter. And that's kind of, you either want them to help you, you know, start doing right, or you want them to tell you blatantly, hey, your voice doesn't matter. Because at least at that point, now you can punch them, you know, you can punch them in the face and be, and, it, and it's fair. Not like literally, but you can organize, you can protest, you can do different stuff. But um, that's what I would suggest, or that's what I would say for like living in the present, you know, find local organizations, talk to your fellow peers in schools, come together, use SGA, look for like restorative practices, the National Student Bill of Rights. The most important thing about the Bill of Rights is that it's an open document, so it applies to anybody that um, comes across it. You can add, you know, any right or anything like that. But yeah, those are just new strategies. My bad. I know I said a lot. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to take a stab at um, how we would honor, how students can honor themselves in this time? Before? right now in the moment. And I also, before we get into that, um, uh, Meg Hurley, uh, John was referring to the Free Minds, Free People Conference. Um, yeah. 
if not, we can move on to the next question. Um, I would say, what advice would you give your freshman self or anyone else that may be on their way to high school for the first time? Um, for me, if I'll go is I would tell him to slow down. Um, high school is way easier than you think and split the work between athletics and school work. So yeah, that's pretty much what I would tell him and everything will be okay. And you're going to look back at yourself and say, oh my God, I came from almost nothing to something and a greater man. That's all I would say. My younger self. Um, if I had to tell my or give myself advice or give anybody advice coming into high school, firstly, um, don't hang around the wrong people or don't be around people who not gonna help you excel in life. Um, that was my biggest thing I struggled with. I got in trouble a lot because I hung around, you know bad influence people and that was my choice you know it, nobody made me do it I did it myself so I had to learn from that um also another thing <laughs> a high school may be easy but it's still like certain stuff like you could have did I could have did better honestly like it was easy I, I made pretty good grades I boosted my GPA but I could have honestly did way better I would say um, coming into high school, uh, my connections with my teacher, I say don't be afraid to build a connection with the teacher. You know, you never know they could be there for you and everything. Um, and yeah, oh, and don't be afraid to be in no club versus what nobody say, because I'm in a band and I play the tuba. And it's like, I didn't want to play the tuba low-key because I didn't want, you know, nobody say nothing about me or that girl playing the tuba, which, you know, but uh, don't be afraid. You better play that instrument. You better join that club, do that, play that sport, you know. Um, don't worry about what nobody got to say. And, yeah, just hang around the right people. Don't worry about what nobody has to say. And don't be afraid to build connections with teachers. And don't be afraid to, oh, how can I say it? I, I can't really get the right word, but yeah, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Um, I, no, no, I was wondering if I could say something now. Um, this is just one of the things we were on. Um, this is one of the things that uh, kind of we talk like, or like for strategies. Um, this is just something called like a strategy chart. It's a little messed up. It's kind of in use, but um, it pretty much is like five. It's like a five steps, and it's kind of like actually like your target audience, and it's like your issue, and then it's like some what are some ideas, some basic ideas. What would it look like six months from now, and stuff like that. But um, and you can find you can like just you can just Google up strat you can Google strategy chart, um, or teach to lead strategy charts, and uh, find something like that. The other thing I was gonna, uh, oh, um, was the National Student Bill of Rights. So this is like a copy of the ballot. Um, I'm moving right now, so I kind of got like all my work stuff in one big old thing. So everything's a little. But, so this is like the ballot. Um, this is like the different rights and stuff, and people can kind of like check them all, and then they would vote down there. And we we tried to collect a bunch of these and turn them into the school board, um, to get it adopted as like official policy. And we're still working on it, but um, and this is like, this looks like something simple and cool, but this is like real live work, you know. And this is like real current ground work that like students, you know, sixteen and seventeen and fourteen and thirteen and fifteen and eighteen year olds put together. You feel me? 
um, to like create real change. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's um, we talk just like the sense of like strategy or like how you can live in like present high school. Thank you, John. It looks like we lost Giovanni again. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm, oh, there you go. Did you wanna, did you wanna go ahead and answer this question before we move forward? Speaking towards me? Yes. Um, I would like to just touch on my um algebra project experience. Um, if I didn't, I came late, so I didn't get to introduce myself. My name is Giovanni Williams, of course, and I'm a senior at Hollandale High School. So I've been in the algebra project. First, I was a participant in the algebra project in ninth grade. Then that was a great and very great learning experience for me. So then I became an MLW. Or YPP worker as Selena, we both were teammates from ninth all the way to my senior year. So basically what we did, you get a group of algebra project people, they would come down, they would train us and we'll learn from it. But the thing that surprised me about my whole experience with that, I learned many things. Um, Specifically, the hands-on learning, the learning, the way they teach math is very hands-on, very realistic. For example, we took a whole field trip when I was in the ninth grade with my teacher. This is a very fun field trip, no, not no math oriented. And I'm wondering like, are we going on a field trip in the math class? So then to my surprise, she later introduced that whole trip we took to each landmark as a number on the number line and how to travel from one place to another, add in and subtract the negative numbers. So then I'm mind blown, I'm like, how, how, like, I never thought of that. We were all so mind blown. So I became very attractive to that feeling and just being mind blown. And then I became a part of that, me and Celine. And then we ended up teaching younger minds to see basically my mini me's come up the way I did, struggling with math and get a level three, a level four, even higher scores than me. And then it's so fun when they see you in school, especially as I am an athlete and a football player. So they see me in school, they would sell. I'm like, oh my God, and people look at me like, there's a total different side of you. It's like my athletic friends and my um school friends. So basically it's just, just a great experience for me. I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was, that was great and that kind of speaks to a question that came up in um our q a chat which we can just move into since we're um about less than 10 minutes out um and so uh john and selena could you could you also describe the impact of the algebra project on you and what made that different from school as you experienced it before Um, okay, so like Dio said, you know, um, it was just different, you know, the math, like how they taught us, like, I love the way the algebra project teach, like, if I could work with them, I would, I love the way they teach, and like how they help us understand math. I, I like math, you know, I never had a problem with math, I always liked it, it was just the teacher who taught it, if that makes sense, like, um my teacher miss Caicedo, best teacher in the world she um helped me so much in the algebra project they both missy and the algebra project went hand to hand on basically breaking down math basically breaking down algebra um and you know we had to take a test at the end of the year like always you know spend the night test we had to take a test algebra EFT, and Usually when I start to take my, I'm not a good test taker at all. And then, I, but I'm really good like at my schoolwork and everything. But when I go on a test, it don't match up. But since I had a teacher who could teach me the math and break down the math in different ways and break down what was gonna be on the test, I um, got a level four on my algebra EOT. 
And that was coming from, I, I got a level one first time I took it. Then I got a level four after the algebra project and my teacher, Miss C, taught me different ways I could learn math. Like Gio said, the trip one, I didn't think, you know, I'm thinking we just going on a field trip, no school today, you know, okay, I'm coming. But we ended up doing like, oh yeah, you can use the number line. Like we turned the trip into math. That was so cool to me. Like, I don't, it was just so cool. Then like we did different things. Like we did so many different activities, so many different, learned so many different things and tie all of that into math. It, that was the best part that I really loved that the Algebra Project and Miss C could do. Cause then when you take an assess, it's like, when I was taking the test, I'm like, oh, I know how to do this. Oh yeah, we learned this. Oh, this is when we went on a trip. The same thing, like, you know, the number line. I just like, it was just really like, if it wasn't for them, wasn't for the Algebra Project, wasn't for Miss C, I don't think I would have been where I'm at with math right now. So yeah, it's just a big impact. Um, for me, I definitely uh, everything I like saying. I think it's like a universal family when it comes to BAP. Um, or it comes to algebra project. Um, I started working with algebra project. Uh, also in my ninth grade year. Um, I was at I was in my high school, and like I said, it's always something going on in Baltimore City High School. I was at a different high school. Um, this high, my first high school I started at, they actually put me out for a um, series of things. Like, I was just getting on their nerves with the organizing. So, if you ask me, they found a way to put me out. Uh, I was going there, and it was, we were protesting some, like, racial stuff that was going on. Um, we had a lot of white teachers and white students just kind of, like, saying the N-word. And nothing was, you know, happening. And we was pretty much at a point where it was like, cool, you know, we could just start fighting about it. So we was we was making up with our minds on whether or not we was going to start like you know how we was going to carry the situation. But long story short, I was organizing and uh one of the older one of the seniors at the time I was in the next grade had said, Yeah, you seem like you really like, you know, this kind of stuff. And, you know, you should come around to the Boss Browser project, which is where I work, and um, you know, see if you like it, see if you want to come around. And uh, I went to a meeting, it was cool. And they had, um, at this time in Baltimore City, um, it was a budget cut and pretty much like, I forgot the numbers. It was like a huge amount of teachers had got fired and a huge amount of like the educational budget had got cut. And then another part of it had got like put on hold for money I was supposed to receive. But then the, um, but like at that same year with that same, same money people, the uh, police budget had doubled um, that year. And not only did they double, but they started like putting, they were putting um, school police officers like heavier in schools and they were like having guns on them in the school and stuff like that. All types of wild, I know, okay, we wasn't going for that. So we were at this, we were at this rally, you know, I had just gotten, I'd been around like a week. I'm just, I'm not, I wasn't even hired yet. I was just kind of chilling at this rally. And one of the people that was supposed to speak didn't show up. Um, and one of the algebra project people were on the stage and they were like, yeah. Um, and he looked around the person and they was like, and now John's going to come up with a few words. And I was like, no, he's not. No, he's not. I was, I was not with it, but I was, they got, they got me up there. I was on the stage. It's like a crowd of people was talking and it was like, it was just, I was fine. You feel me? It was really like a family feel. You feel me? Um, the biggest thing I've definitely taken from algebra project is like how to address issues. There's an answer for every problem. And that's kind of down to like our pedagogy. Um, we have a five step pedagogy in our math literacy that we use. And it really does show you like how to deal with, um, I mean, we use it on math, but it also applies to like the real world, you know, how to just solve things, how to, you know, deal with stuff. Whether it's there's never water in our building, who do I talk to about that? All right, that person not taking me seriously, who do I talk to? of that person about that. Having that stuff be common knowledge, you know, making sure that young people are educated about the systems that they're in. Um, and that's something that I would like to say, I know a little something about, you know, if, we, if we're like in the car, we're taking a ride and there's like a pothole and I hear my mother fussing about the pothole, I, you know, I kind of joke and think to myself, like, I know who I could call. I, like, I know the person I can actually call and be like, yo, 
I might just hit a pothole, bro. Talk to this person, this person, this person. But that's just from BAP, you know, like having connections or whatever. But that's something that like I would have never imagined. Uh, that's 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 an issue I never thought I would have actually been able to do anything, you know, about or know something about. Um, but yeah, it's really like a family feel. This, you know, it was kind of like it's like we just figuring this thing out, whatever the thing is, whether it's a math problem, a social issue problem. Um, we trying to you trying to get a bill passed. It's like we just figuring it out. We a family. And um, the last, other thing I would add that's really important about Algebra Project and something that we do at the Baltimore Algebra Project um, is that youth organizing or like youth empowerment isn't, you know, like a campaign that you work on, but it is a framework to use to work on anything. You feel me? So if young people come together and go clean up the community, that's, you know, that's like we're cleaning up, but that's the campaign isn't youth, you know, it's young people who are empowering themselves to the clean of their community. You feel me? That's young people. That's we're doing other stuff through youth organizing. You feel me? Through uh the framework of youth empowerment and stuff like that. Whether, you know, so it's Selena and YPP or if it's, you know, Giovanni, um, it's whichever one of us, you know, we all uh as young people, whatever we do is organizing or whatever good stuff we do is organizing. But it's also like you know youth empowerment, so that's something that I learned. Um, and that's I think that's why the question of like why young people voices matter was so like big for uh, so big for me because it's like it's a it's a framework instead of like a one target area. But that's what I got from B A P. Thank you guys. Thank you, Selena, John. Gio, thank you guys for joining us and offering so much, the wealth of, of knowledge and insight. I'm appreciative and thank you all for being here to listen. Um, so with that being said, we're closing out and I'm going to pass it to Brian to take us out of here. Nautica, and thank you to you uh, for being our moderator for these brilliant young people. Uh, we appreciate your insight and your wisdom as well. Thank you so much. And I think you, they can tone and tune into your program, right? It's on uh, WRFG, does it, it's on the internet, correct? So they can still tune in. Can you tell them a little bit about your project, about the, the program? Yeah, WRFG.org. Um, it's uh, on, you can stream the actual live radio online. So um, yeah, we, we actually have a show coming up next Friday um we're talking about thanksgiving and colonialism so that should be interesting uh so yeah if you guys want to know about that or hear it it is you can go on wrp.org and listen stream live thank you and john giovanni selena thank you so much for sharing of your wisdom but more importantly thank you for the work that you all are doing uh, through uh, ap through ypp uh, you know, you're passing on what you've learned to others that are coming behind you. And, and you're also educating us. And we appreciate that today for taking the time to educate us. Uh, so we appreciate everything you've done today. And I'm going to ask the people in the chat, if you give our young people in Nautica some love, let them know what you that you appreciate them. Um, and, uh, and also, if you are interested, uh, please check out the Algebra Project, check out uh, the Young People's Project, check out Radical Equations and the work of Bob Moses. Uh, check out quality education as a constitutional right, which is another part of this work. Uh, there's lots and lots of opportunities for you to connect. This is a national movement in education, and we're, they're looking for people to get involved. So please take a moment and learn more about the Audra Project and Young People's Project. Thank you again. So with that, we are actually moving into our next set of concurrent sessions. Um, we have uh, two concurrent, two, two uh, presentations during this, this time. You also have the opportunity, we have an open room. So one of the things, um, we're into our next uh, whole group session. I hope that you all are enjoying the conference and getting a lot out of it. Um, I look forward to hearing from you in the chat about uh, what you're learning in some of our small group sessions. I've heard good things about them, so we'd love to hear in the chat what you're taking away. Also in the chat, hey, we'd love to hear where you're coming in from. So if you wanna put in the chat where you're actually coming in from today, we've got people from around the world and across the United States. So give a shout out to where you're coming in from today so we can, so we can see where, you're, where our, our folks are, our participants are coming from. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next whole group session. Um, and uh, this session is looking at the topic of play and our children's right to play. Uh, and we have three wonderful participants and panelists for this session. Uh, first, it's Vera Stenhouse. Uh, Vera is an educator, book author, facilitator, evaluator, and multidisciplinary researcher with an emphasis on diversity, equity, and multicultural education. She has written on play and social justice, encourages playful experiential pedagogical practices in teaching and learning K-12 through higher education. Our next presenter is Dr. Olga Jarrett, Professor Emerita of Science Education in the Department of Early Childhood and Elementary Education at George State University. She's a project evaluator for the National Science Foundation, a past president of the Associ Association for the Study of, the, of Play and the American Association for the Child's Right to Play. She's a researcher and author on recess, science, and play and social justice. And finally, she's a member of the Global Recess Alliance, who's a collaborator for this particular session. Collaborator for this particular session, sorry. And then finally, Anna Barrison, Professor of Psychology and Folklore at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, co-editor of the International Journal of Play. She's a researcher and author of two books on recess in urban settings, and co-editor of the International Journal of Play, and a, also a member of the Global Recess Alliance. So we're very excited about this particular session because we know of the importance of play for all children, for adults. Um, and we just want to make sure that uh, we give you enough opportunity. We're going to work to get Olga on. We're still working to get Olga on. But Anna, we'd love it if you could get us started. Hello. So I'm going to start. That's awesome. You just uh, pulled a little bit of a 180 off me. That's awesome. Oh, so, well, did you want Vera to start? No, I'm whatever Vera prefers. Okay. Um, I can't hear Vera. I apologize. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Anna. Okay, so shall I start? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, I'm going to start. So um, thank you to the university. Thank you, Brian. Thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting me. Um, and I wish I could see all of your faces. It's it's particularly challenging. Usually when we teach on Zoom, we at least get to see little squares. But right now I see that there's 78 of you out there and I'm waving to you. And I do encourage you to put your questions or comments in the chat. Um, so I wanna share with you some of the things that I've recorded um, on playgrounds in Philadelphia that are related to our topic today. So. World Trade Center is falling down, falling down, falling down. World Trade Center is falling down on top of us right after 9-11. This one was, this is Channel 10 News, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello, it had been an accident yesterday on the boulevard. Two cars and a truck hit each other. Car fell over and car blew up. That's it, no more news is today. This is Channel 3 News, 3, 2, 1. Don't you ever, ever in your life go to California or you'll get shot. That was recorded right after the Rodney King case in 1991. So I'm an editor of the International Journal of Play and a colleague from the UK shared this story with me, a woman named Rebecca Oberg. She said, I had come outside for a break from work and my kids were on the trampoline playing Dodge the Virus. The game would commence by her son Theo batting a sensory ball that loosely resembles the virus pictures that we see everywhere while he was on the trampoline. And she heard Theo tell Emmeline, his sister, that the use of a cricket bat was to release the ball was representing the spread of the virus from the bat. And then the two of them would jump on the trampoline, dodging the ball. And if the ball hit them once, they would self-isolate at the edge of the trampoline, counting up to 10. This could happen three times, but once the ball hit you a fourth time, dramatic coughing would ensue and they would fall over and die. And the game was played on and off for two weeks, but she had not seen it since. 
In the April 1st, 2020 Atlantic Monthly Magazine, Bradley Madison of Winnipeg, Manitoba shared that his four sons have recently enjoyed playing Corona Ball, a game that involves dodging a spiky plastic ball that loosely resembles the virus. And before the schools in Kansas City, Missouri closed, Nathan Hopper's eight-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son played multiple virus-related games invented by their, their peers. Social distancing tag was ingeniously responding to demands that people keep their distance by allowing whoever was it to tag another child's shadow. So when children encounter pain or loss or confusion, it comes out in play. And this is actually a sign of health. We have known for over 100 years of child psychology from Freud to Erickson, Axline to Winnicott, even through Piaget, the practice of fairness and optimism emerges in play itself. My teacher, a great man named Brian Sutton Smith said, quote, play is primarily a fortification against the disabilities of life. I'm gonna say that again. Play is primarily a fortification against the disabilities of life. So I wanna invite you for a quick moment in the chat to put in what are the signs that you see when kids are experiencing trouble or emotional distress? How do you know? What does it look like? Put it in the chat. We'll take a minute. What does it look like when a kid is expressing some kind of challenge or trouble? How do you know between the ordinary and the extraordinary of their, or their stress? So one way it comes out is if they stop eating or if they eat in a way that's unusual for them or they don't sleep or they sleep too much or they don't socialize. One woman just wrote, oh, some of my chat just appeared and disappeared. Hold on. Hold on. Chat. They tend to act out and display anger, absolutely. They don't socialize and they don't play. And when we know that kids don't play, it's a sign of ill health. We also know it's extremely, did anyone else just freeze for a long time? I don't know. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Yes. Okay, okay I'll keep going. Um, we know it's extremely damaging when play is taken away. And children and teens who do not play are like kids who do not eat or sleep. As was noted in the chat, their behavior becomes erratic and typically antisocial. But what's the answer? So if children aren't social, they need to play. If children are suffering from trauma, they need to play. Children overscheduled by adults or drained by Zoom, they need to play. Classmates needing to bond, they need to play too. So there's this growing literature about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, and I'm sure many of you know all about that. Um, and if people need a crash course in understanding this, I recommend the TED Talk by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, B-U-R-K-E, Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. Um, her 2014 TED Talk is on YouTube. And the talk is how childhood trauma affects health. And I'm gonna quote her here. Adverse childhood experiences study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Anda at the CDC. And together they asked 17,500 adults about their history of exposure to what they called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And what they did was then correlate these ACE scores against health outcomes. And what they found was striking, two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found out was that there was a dose response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. Higher your score, the worse your health outcomes. 
And it was not just physical health. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk for depression was four and a half times those with a score of zero. For suicide, it was 12 times. This is the most important part here for our discussion. Children are especially se sensitive to repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, which is essential for school, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So back to our discussion. COVID for some children can be considered an adverse childhood experience. How? Feel free to put it in the chat, but I'm gonna list some because we're short on time, but I'd love to hear from your comments in the chat. Witnessing a family stress, job loss, illness, or death. Few opportunities to be with friends. Extreme isolation, lack of privacy, lack of new or novel materials. Overstimulation with online materials. Lack of exercise and inconsistent routines. So what does play offer? Not sure about safety? Let's run home and back and home again. Not sure about health? Play with medical props. Not sure about your strength? Draw and play superheroes over and over until you are. Not sure about your ability to strategize your way out? Play games of strategy. Like the practice of a kitten playing with a toy mouse or children pretending, playing games for older kids allow for the safe practice of fictitious problem solving, the fluid exchange of roles, and the indirect practice of life skills. And what do many structures on playgrounds offer? Balance. And it's not just a physical thing. It's a metaphor. So in play, the locus of control is in the child's hands, not the gym teacher's hands, not the parent's hands, not the play coach's hands, in the child's hands. So in conclusion, schools must do more than cognitive catch-up, whether in person or online. They need to do more than just discuss how children feel. Play is considered to be the child. I'm hearing beeps, are you okay? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, that's awesome. So as I concluded, we're talking about communication, and then I hear this little buzzing thing. So play is considered a child's primary form of communication through age eight in normal times and much older in situations of trauma. Children, and I'm not talking about little ones, children, all children will need to move their bodies and express themselves indirectly through play. It is their primary form of, of expression their primary form of self-healing. We owe them time to play now and for their whole childhood. Minority children, especially in public schools in urban areas, have been the ones to lose recess for administrative reasons, for punishment, or for catch-up. It is a social justice issue that all children have time to move, play, and heal in a COVID-filled and post-COVID world. And if we take a moment to look at recess internationally, in the US, in pre-COVID times, the US was near the bottom of the list of the amount of time it reserves for elementary school play, at the bottom. And given COVID in its wake of trauma, children will need even more every single day. So how much time are we talking about? We know that young animals on an average spend about 20% of their time at play, and for some species, it's about 50%. This comes from um, the work of Pellis and Pellis, who write about neurology and uh, the, the, the neuroscience of brain development. The average pre-COVID amount of time for children to play at school was 5% of their school day, if you're even having recess. Countries that do that 20% include New Zealand, Israel, Republic of Korea, Japan, Finland. 84, 84 minutes a day, every day. So if we are averaging pre-COVID 22 minutes a day on a good day, we need more and we need it as an everyday practice, as a sacred right of childhood. Props and materials do not have to be fancy. Playgrounds do not have to be fancy. Balls, ropes, chalk, hoops, and even socks. 
sucks. Like sock puppets. Dealing with trauma, whether in school or on online, cannot just be an adult led activity, not just a talking activity, not just a one and done, and not as an extra, as a side dish to math and reading. And I thank you. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, and that way we can make sure that we can engage in some dialogue with our, our panelists here, our participants here. <laughs> you got some love for sock puppets there, <laughs> clearly. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna transition and I think Anna the maybe the goal will be for us to uh, hear from Vera and hear from Olga as well and then come back together for a, a large conversation. Wonderful. All right, so let's uh, let's move to Olga. Can we move to Olga now? Yes, unfortunately, I can't get on for some strange reason. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Ah, good. Okay, but you're not seeing me. So maybe that's good. I don't know. Uh, uh, our, perp our plan was that Vera was going to start with uh, uh, an activity. And uh, just a moment. We're plugging this phone in so that we don't lose our battery. Um, and and I was going to go next and Anna was going to go third. <laughs> and um, I really, I got in on some of Anna's talk and I enjoyed it so much. I was thinking maybe she should just continue to talk. Um, and I don't know whether Vera is going to be able to get in or not. We, some of us are having technical problems here, but um, uh, Anna, did you talk about the Global Recess Alliance? Not yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about that. And uh, uh, you can be prepared to answer the questions that people are thinking of from your talk. Um, Anna and I are both members of the Global Recess Alliance, which uh, was organized last spring to support the need for recess when schools reopen, and we thought they were going to reopen well before now. Uh, we believe that recess is critical for social emotional learning, uh, and the, uh, this group is made up of uh, researchers on recess from Canada, the US, Australia, Finland, and England. And uh, later on, I will show you the website uh, where everyone is encouraged to register their support for recess. So that's something you can do if you believe everybody should have recess. Um, I want to talk to you like Anna did about the importance of play in general and recess in particular. Uh, so you're getting it from both of us. Um, I think people often think of, of play as something superficial, uh, but the conventions on the rights of the child which is a treaty under the UN, says that play is one of the rights of children and not just privileges, it's a right. And this is what Article 31 says. States parties recognize the right of the child to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child and to participate freely in the cultural life and the arts. So, uh, this is an important treaty, and if you'll show the first slide. It's up. Your first slide is up. Okay. Here are children in Uganda, and, and they are playing do, during recess. And uh, like Anna says, children in many other countries have a lot more recess than kids in the U.S., uh, including children in Uganda who have several recess breaks during the day. But here you see their jumping rope, and they're very active. They're probably counting and rhyming, and the kids are coordinating with one another to make the play happen, and they're having fun. Uh, I particularly want you to see the sign in the back on the, on the uh, school building side. Uh, the sign uh, mentions the, conventions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and uh, under it in blue, where you can't see it very well, are, are various rights that they want kids to know that they have, including the child's right to play. Uh, 
a a bit about the convention. Uh, all nations of the world except the U.S. have ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, the U.S. helped to write it in the 1980s, and under the Clinton administration, it was signed. But as a treaty, it needs to be ratified by the Senate, and it's not even been introduced into the Senate. Uh, every other nation in the world has ratified it except for the U.S., Play is critical for healthy physical, social, and emotional development. Birds play, rodents play, horses play, dolphins play, pandas play. Research on many animals, including monkeys, rats, and pandas, as well as humans, show that play deprivation causes social and emotional damage. Uh, play can be done between a parent and a child. And kids can play by themselves, play with ideas, pretend, have imaginary friends and so forth. But it is especially important both for animal play that's been studying and for humans that children be able to play with peers. Uh, what I'd like you to do now is to think about what play really is. How would you define or describe play? Could you put your thoughts in the chat box and somebody's going to need to tell me what people are saying. Uh, I'll allow a few, maybe 20 seconds or so for you to just put the first thoughts that come into your head. So, uh, all of the act of engaging your mind and body to use your imagination and exercise. Okay, those are some good ones. Uh, will you put exercise. up the, the next slide? Yeah. Uh, play has a lot of different aspects and the things that were mentioned are good. Um, if you take a look at these balloons uh, that I put together uh, on this slide, uh, you will see the definition of play by Ed Klugman, who was a professor emeritus. He is a professor emeritus at Wheelock College. And he mentioned these various aspects that are often part of play. Uh, the actively engaging, uh, when you're really being passive, like being a couch potato and watching TV, you're not really playing. It might, you might consider it recreation, but it's not considered play. Uh, it's intrinsically motivated. You do it because you want to do it, and you freely choose to do it. Uh, it's non-literal. It can be pretend, um, make-believe, uh, or as if, like a lot of games uh, when you're playing Monopoly, you're not really um, it's trading uh, investments. Um, enjoyable, you do it because you want to do it, because it's fun, and it involves the mind. Uh, it's, it, your, your brain is working while your body is working when you're playing. Um, pure play seems to include most of these aspects. Uh, not all are necessary for it to be play. If just a few are included, we might call it playful. Uh, you know, that it's, it's hard to have activities that are organized by a teacher that might include all of those, but they need to include uh, a number of them to be considered play. There are many ways that learning can be made fun uh, through games, science and social studies project, you know, the kind where you could take the initiative and really get involved, figure things out for yourself. Uh, drama, puppetry, you had a puppet act, act, aspect of your uh, program today. Uh, music, tinkering, art, uh, and recess, uh, where children can be physically active, more actively involved and they generally are during PE because there's a lot of instructional time in PE and where they learn how to organize their own games and learn how to play fair with other children. 
whether we talk about pure play or playful activities, children below the poverty line and placed at a disadvantage based on race or ethnicity uh, are less apt to have fun at school. Uh, Anna mentioned that uh, we, there is a lot of discrimination in terms of who gets to enjoy school, both for recess and for other activities. Nationwide, these children are less likely to have recess and more apt to spend their days in test preparation rather than activities they consider fun. And many of these same children are now having challenges with virtual learning. Ah, you can see the problems that I'm having with virtual learning. Um, anyway, uh, I, I'm next going to mention three bullet points from the research that I've conducted on recess. And I engaged in a number of studies between 1998 and 2015 when I retired. So in one, um, I looked at fourth graders. And the fourth graders that had recess were more on task and less fidgety than when they didn't have recess. Uh, I'll say that again. When they, on the days that they had recess, and we randomly assigned recess and non-recess days, and they normally did not have recess at all, uh, they were more on task and less fidgety when they had recess. So that's good for learning, and it's also good for classroom management. And in another study, in a school where almost all the children were below the poverty line, but they did have recess daily. Uh, the children were active during recess. They made up their own games. They worked out their own conflicts. They didn't engage in negative behavior. Uh, and this is from research with first, third, and fifth graders. And when I say they didn't engage in negative behavior, we observed them several times a week for several months and we found only one incident that we coded as negative. Of my students who were first year teachers and teacher and student teachers in my teacher education class, uh, over, and I did this over four years, only a little over half had recess on a beautiful day. And I specifically asked them on a beautiful day whether they had had recess. A little over half had had recess on that day, and about half of those that had recess kept at least one child in from recess as punishment. Uh, if recess is an important part of development, taking it away should not be used as punishment. Georgia is one of the states without a requirement for recess. Uh, there are 16 states that have, they don't all call it recess, but have mandates of requirements that are either called recess or are play activity time. Um, I've been trying for many years, unsuccessfully I might say, to get recess mandated in Georgia. In 2018, the Georgia legislature passed the bipartisan recess bill but it was vetoed by Governor Kemp. So we do not have required recess in Georgia. It's up to the school systems to decide how to handle recess. So back to the issue of virtual learning, um, fun and peer interaction like recess needs to be built into virtual learning and kids need recess when they go back to school. And I'm convinced that it can be built into virtual learning. I've, uh, Vera had an activity she was going to do with you that, that would have shown that. But I've also in, involved with games and learning activities with my five-year-old uh, grandson on Zoom. Uh, so uh, I think we can talk later if you have questions about how to make it safe how to make uh, recess safe, how to make play safe in the classroom. Uh, but definitely there are ways while schools are still open virtually uh, to make learning fun. Uh, well, I've got, I'll stop here and uh, see what questions you have for the 
for the two of us. And then at the end, I'm going to show you t show two slides uh, where you can get more information. And Olga, also, I think Vera may have maybe on. Vera, are you there? Can you hear me? We can. Yes, can you wonderful. Are you hearing that? Okay, good. We'll let Vera take over and she can uh, demonstrate the game that she was going to do with you. All right. Let me. All right. Brian, you can start us I think you're fading in and out. Okay, I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. Let me do the chat. So, Vera, I, I mean, I think you're fading in and out. I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, how about this? We'll, we'll, we'll let's give some questions to Anna and Olga, and then we can try to work the problem and see if we can get you in at the very end. All right. Okay. All right. So I want to uh, wanted to open the floor up for some questions in the chat. If you have questions in the chat. Um, so there is one question right now from Stacy French Lee. Uh, what collective action can we take to get the upcoming administration to make ratification of the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child a priority? Oh boy, that's a hard one. Uh, for so long, nothing has happened. Uh, there, there was a, a national group for a while uh, that was a meeting regularly and trying to get the in issue um, uh, under consideration, and I could not find their information this time. So uh, I, I think uh, IPA USA, the American Association for the Child's Right to Play, uh, is is planning to try to do something, uh, and are still talking about what kind of action to take. Um, I think, um, frankly, uh, we need to get through the Georgia election for the Senate and see what happens from there. And uh, then if, if we can get a group of people interested to raise the issue again, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's worth giving it a try. Uh, some of the issues that people have argued about, those in power, uh, are that the Convention on the Rights of the Child says that that uh, youth under the age of 18 should not be armed. And then there are people saying, well, does that mean you can't have ROTC in high school? Well, I don't think they're actually armed. I may be, be wrong on that. But uh, And another issue is, what constitutes a child? Uh, is a child a child from conception, or is a child a child from birth? And these are issues that have come up with people that don't want to try touch this. Uh, the question is, why is the rest of the world willing to uh, make decisions about childhood that the U.S. is not willing to make? Good question. Now, I don't know if you want to weigh in. Yeah. Um, I'd like to respond to, an, I, I mean, Olga to me is the, a, a wonderful um, leader in the field internationally about this subject. So I'm going to leave that particular question to Olga. There was a question in the chat or a comment in the chat about the removal of recess as punishment. Um, someone said that their daughter had recess removed as a form of punishment, and it just led to the children being upset and increasing the chaos. I want to point people to a really fine article on this subject. The American Academy of Pediatricians uh, wrote a statement, and one of the key authors is a, a pediatrician named Kenneth Ginsberg. And uh, so you can find it if you Google Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg and recess. And the Academy of, Phys of Physicians came out and said that the removal of recess should not be used as a punishment. It's not a, a mandate or a statement in terms of policy, but it's a recommendation. Uh, and I think one of the best uh, advocacy moves was the partnering of recess researchers with 
the, uh, the voices of pediatricians, because pediatricians have a tremendous amount of respect and power in our culture um, and a tremendous amount of access to young children. So um, I think going forward to circle back to the policy question, the more organizations that can come together in service of childhood, uh, the stronger the message uh, can be. So eventually I would love to see the American Academy of Physicians and the Global Recess Alliance and the AERA and all of the organizations that involve educators of any kind to come together um, to uh, support recess. There was one other um, uh, question that I saw in the chat, and if I've missed one of yours, feel free to put it in again or have someone else read it. Um, one person wrote, do we believe in uh, the blending of academic uh, subjects and play? Uh, the author remembers throwing a ball around the room and spelling words in first grade and always learn them so quickly. So that points to this idea that play is the natural way that children learn. It's not hard to get an infant to learn. They're curious, they're ready to learn. Uh, they can't help but learn. And when kids are supported in schools in a playful way, they soak it up and they can't help but be excited about learning. So I think we can learn from play about how to be better educators, uh, but we also shouldn't confuse what goes on in the classroom as playful as it can be with what kids get from being with their peers on the playground. They're both, they're both important vitamins in their nutrition. Thank you. Uh, I will second that. <laughs> That's a, a good question and a good answer. There's uh, another question. I'd love to know what ideas you all may have for implementing something as close to recess as possible on Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think there are a number of activities that can be done on Zoom. Um, I, I think you can uh, get, you can put kids in, in chat in small groups so that they can interact with one another and, uh, and give them a game to play. Um, I, with my grandson, I, we've played guessing games, you know, 20 questions. I see something, you know, red uh, or whatever. Um, and uh, one can challenge kids to uh, take breaks during uh, Zoom calls uh, and uh, run around the room or do jumping jacks or whatever. Uh, there are also activities like uh, my favorite activity. Anybody who's been in my classes knows that I love to make paper helicopters. And uh, in Turkey, they've been making paper helicopters as an activity on Zoom. So uh, that's something that I think could be done with kids. Activities with uh, junk materials that most kids would have at home or give kits to um, families of materials that are used for hands-on activities. Uh, but I would like to see uh, times when they match kids up in uh, chat rooms and, uh, and give them a, a fun activity to try together. I think that's really possible. May I jump in too? Sure, sure, of course. So I like to think of, I'm gonna answer this in reverse. I like to think of play itself as exaggerated, negotiated, indirect movement. And I think there's a lot that we can do to bring out exaggeration, negotiation, and indirectness on Zoom. So one of the challenges I know from our own adult worlds on Zoom is that it's so linear and so focused. It's time on task and you're doing a task and you're doing the next task. And our brains aren't wired to just make a straight line. Um, and children are wired to stretch those boundaries and exaggerate things and try to see how else something can be solved. So part of this is in the design of the tasks that we ask children, if they can be made more flexible, um, and for example, uh, someone just wrote in the chat, my nephew's kindergarten teacher used scavenger hunts to help them learn their colors. That's fabulous because it's indirect and it's exaggerated. It's not just, here's a color, memorize it. You're trying to get at the same idea indirectly and through exaggeration. 
Um, movement. Movement is essential for children. We are not, as a species, supposed to be sitting on our fannies the whole day. And children are wired to move. It's part of how their bones grow, is by moving and stomping and, and moving around. So um, there's a lot of uh, literature now about the importance of brain breaks. And this was even before we all had to be online. So if we could structure our time together so that we allow for short-term five, 10 minute jumping around brain breaks. I've started to give my own college students uh, a short brain break in one of my afternoon classes because by four o'clock in the afternoon, it, they've been on Zoom all day long and it's, it's draining for, an, for a grown up. So I've given them just short five, 10 minute breaks and it has made a world of difference. Even if they just stand up, sit down, do something that pleases them and it uncrosses their eyeballs. So. Um, for a resource, there's also an organization called Playworks, P-L-A-Y-W-O-R-K-S, Playworks, and they have a huge number of resources online for games that are virtual and also games that um, kids can do while socially distancing. So that's a fine resource um, in terms of specific games and activities. But the best thing we can do um, is materials and freedom. Another person in the chat writes, I've been putting together science kits and letting parents pick them up from school and they can still be hands-on while on Microsoft Teams. Fabulous idea. Um, one of the things that I know in Philadelphia before COVID was that schoolyards had no materials for, for recess. They had no balls, they had no jump ropes, they had no hoops, no chalk. And so one of the projects I worked on with my students was getting a grant and delivering to many, many, many schoolyards um, basic materials. I think the longer we stay online, the more we're going to need to make sure that kids in our neighborhoods have access to science kits, um, sports kits, art kits, all kinds of materials for them to express themselves with. Uh, I agree. Let me let me throw in one more idea uh, when we were talking about how to um, incorporate play. Uh, the use of puppetry. Uh, the puppets can be made of socks, and I've been saving somehow. I think my washer or my dryer eats socks, and so I often have one sock that's left over, and I've been saving those one socks. Uh, if kids make puppets, they can use their imagination, but they also can be building vocabulary and writing puppet plays and uh, using uh, puppets in many ways. And I believe as part of today, you got uh, a uh, template for making uh, shadow puppets. Uh, and uh, those those puppets are also things that can be used online and kids can be taking on various characters and uh, uh, talking to one another uh, through puppet play. Uh, they can write them down uh, or just do it visually. They can use art supplies to decorate their socks and uh, also make puppets out of uh, cardstock. So I just wanted to add that one. And to add to this, I think, uh, with regard to this question, uh, so I know that Vera Stenhouse had planned to do some play today uh, via this technology. And, and so what we're gonna do, because Vera, we're having some technical difficulties getting Vera in, we're actually gonna record Vera's piece offline and then weave it into this session so that she'll, she'll be represented. And you can also see what she was going to demonstrate to you you know, just ideas of how to do this type of work with children, or not work, how to just have a play with children. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I think we have time for another question. Do you think the idea of taking away recess will make students more likely to be on task next time, though? No. Uh, kids need recess partly to... Um, to be active and to be more able to function in the classroom. So there's really no indication that if you deprive a kid of recess, they're going to behave better. They, they just may be more resentful. Uh, it's, uh, I, I agree the pediatricians uh, 
let's say everybody needs recess, the PE teachers that are supporting recess uh, say the same. Uh, everybody needs it. And it tends to be the same kids that are punished with recess deprivation over and over and over. And uh, they become more resentful and their behavior does not improve. I'd, I'd like to underscore that and and can you hear me? Am I am I on yes. again? Yes, thank you. Um, education isn't just about the next 45 minutes. Education is about a lifelong process and a love of learning, right? And so part of the thing that we're looking at is a very, very old conflict about the carrot versus the stick. And it, when children are denied a chance to express themselves, it's like denying them water or air. You know, they might be really motivated for the next half hour to do what you ask, but then they'll shut down and they won't want to participate. There's a lot of evidence that by increasing the amount of, of recess, we have a colleague in the Global Recess Alliance who has uh, been working with Texas Christian University, um, and they've been adding extra recess times. There's a couple of school districts that are experimenting with having four or five recesses during the day. And the results have been enormous so that kids are, are relaxed when they come back to school, when they come back to class. They're relaxed and they're open and they're ready to learn because they've gotten their, their wiggles out. So this idea of um, punishing kids or with, withdrawing the freedom to express themselves, which is what removing uh, recess is, um, may uh, allow a child to sit still, but it's not going to allow a child to thrive. And what we want is uh, a future of people who are excited to learn and who are thriving. Yeah, the the um, the bill that was passed in 2018 in Georgia and vetoed by the governor had a a clause in there that you could not take away recess as punishment. And a number of states that do have recess legislation. Uh, have a clause of that type. You cannot use it as punishment. I have a question. Oh, I wanted to want to mention. Let me mention one more thing. Of um, uh, it was talking about who gets recess and who doesn't, and what's happening around the world. Uh, in Finland and in Turkey, children have 15-minute recess break every hour. Every hour, they they study for 45 minutes and they go outside for 15, and that's all the way through high school. Uh, and by the way, the CDC says that in the U.S., recess should go on through high school. You might not call it recess, but they need a recess type break in high school. But I saw uh, a high school in uh, Turkey where. Uh, the kids were playing, they had organized a soccer game, and uh, at the end of their 15 minutes, they all went back in the building. 45 minutes later, they picked up the game where they left off an hour before. It was really fun to watch. And if I could piggyback off of that, um, Olga and I both were at the same uh, international conference together in, in Turkey, and I was giving a, a, a lecture at the conference about recess in America, and I explained that in Philadelphia, children had 15 to 20 minutes of recess, and the Turkish educators were saying, oh, just like us, we have 15 to 20 minutes, and we realized after, after talking that they meant after every hour, and I was saying once a day, and when they realized that our children had 15 to 20 minute break once a day, they looked at us like, you guys are out of your mind to treat children like that. So there's a lot of room to grow. There's a lot of room to grow. And you've got a couple of participants uh, on from Turkey. And so they're sending you a little bit of love. Yay, thank uh, you, thank you. Hey, and great. So I, I wanna keep, uh, we have a little bit of time left and I, I do wanna make sure that we spend a little bit of time on this misconception that play is something that is really located in the early childhood space solely. Uh, and if we could talk a bit just about what does it mean for middle and secondary? And then also the other piece that I'm talking to, because I'm a teacher educator and I'm talking to districts, is that our teachers are under tremendous stress right now. 
And so if you could also talk about the benefits of play for adults. I know yes. this session is really on children, but let's spend just a bit of time just talking about what are the benefits for adults. May I jump in? Sure. So when I was doing my initial research, which became the book Recess Battles, uh, published by University Press of Mississippi, um, when I went to do my field work on the first day, I was told that recess was canceled because it was too violent. And the teachers insisted that the principal bring it back because they said, we need a break. The teachers brought it back, not because the, the kids needed it. The teacher said, it's the only time for us to go to the bathroom. And so the pressure from the union and the teachers brought back recess for 500 children in this one school. And the principal, oh. who is a very educated, smart man, turned to me and said, yeah, but once they hit age 10, they don't need to play anymore. 10 year olds, and I'm quoting him, are too old to play. And I, oh, I, was, uh, sad. I was in shock by it and then was able to demonstrate to him through basically lots of video work um, that his 10 year olds in his school really, really treasured their playtime. So this idea that there's a certain age when we stop playing is, of, of course, absurd. What happens, though, is that as we age, we can find other ways of expressing ourselves. But we know from the study of trauma, and we, have, we are talking about trauma in a COVID world, that when kids are traumatized, and even when we're traumatized, that we return to the body as a way of, 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 of the word I'm looking for as a as a canvas as a way of expressing ourselves and so it's essential that we allow children the opportunity to express themselves through their body through um, through song through art through chalk through ball games to through drama to express themselves no matter how old they are and I love that somebody just typed in the chat too old to play I still play too I believe that. I think most people who work in education still treasure that inner child and appreciate that desire to play. And we have to really fight against the administrative push to edit that out. We have to fight to reinsert play back into the curriculum and into the style in which that we work with kids. Olga? You have anything? You yeah, I agree. I agree with Anna and um and let me say again that the CDC says that there should be recess breaks up through high school. And in Turkey, they continue the 15 minutes off every hour up through high school. Uh, but there are some schools that are experimenting with what this means, uh, leaving open a period of time when the gyms kept open and kids can go uh, and play basketball or when they can hang out with their friends in a computer lab or whatever uh, they consider relaxing and social. Uh, and that that's, that's, really, um, that's really critical and something that I don't think uh, policymakers have been thinking about or talking about at all. And I agree that uh, we as adults need playtime as well, and it looks different for people. I mean, for some, it's it's uh, uh, going to the gym, and for others, it's hobbies of various kinds. But we do need uh, downtime and time to socialize, even if it's on Zoom. Um, I, I want to jump in and, and say there was a wonderful, wonderful quote in the chat that I'm writing down, and I so appreciate whoever wrote this, that play is joy for social well-being. What a wonderful way to phrase Ooh. it. Joy I for like social well-being. Whoever wrote that, I appreciate that. And if we, if we do anything as educators, I would hope it's to preserve that sense of joy for social well-being. So we're, yeah, we're right at the. I've uh, got two. Go ahead. I've got two slides that we need to have time to show. Yep. At least. You know, before I, I know we're running out of time, so uh, I don't know if you have time for any other questions first, but I want to make sure that uh, we get to show those two slides. 
All right, there, Olga, I got the slides up. You want to show the one? Uh, well, the first one is the Global Recess Alliance, and uh, it simply has a, a, a website there uh, to to read about this group's uh, concern about recess as healing and the importance of recess when schools reopen. And uh, it's not a, a how-to type thing. I think we need to uh, see what the, the uh, medical people and the public health people have to say. I would follow the CDC recommendations on how you do it but it is possible to have recess once school opens. And uh, if you're interested in going to that website, maybe you can take a screenshot of it and uh, go back to it. Uh, there's a place for you to sign your name if you agree with it. And the next uh, and last slide is IPA USA. And again, it's, it's just their web, their web page is at ipausa.org. Uh, and they have on that website a, a, a document that I wrote last year uh, called Recess Based Case, a research based case for recess. It's a position paper uh, from the US Play Coalition of the American Association for the Child's Right to Play and the Alliance for Childhood that, that gives you the, what the research says. And so if you want to go to your um, political representative uh, and uh, try to get recess mandated in your, in your school or in the whole state or in whatever state you are um, or what kind of a country you are, uh, I think you'll find that an, a, an important summary of what the research says about the importance of recess. Thank you. And yeah, all, of, all of our sessions are going to be recorded, and so um, you'll have access to this this session uh, later on. So if you don't get that information now, but uh, it's ipausa.org, and we'll put up the global. Let's go back, and this is the Global Recess Alliance. Right. Some great resources for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. And thank you, Anna. This has been wonderful. It's something that we thought was very important to talk about, particularly given what our world is dealing with and what our children are going through right now. And so thank you for sharing. And I'm hoping that the people in the uh, that participated in the session felt that it was valuable and got something out of it. If you did, please show some love in the chat. Uh, let them know what you thought. Um, and uh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our children appreciate you. Thank you. We're continuing to fight for them. Thanks so much for inviting us. All right, folks, so we are actually moving into our final session of the day. Uh, this is our final closing keynote. It's a conversation uh, between me and Dr. Joyce King, and we will be starting that at three o'clock. Please don't miss it. We'll see you in just a little while. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2020 Sources of Urban Educational Excellence Conference, if you're just joining us. If you've been here all day, 
uh, today has been magical. It's been amazing, the people that we've heard from. And I hope that you found this to be a really valuable experience today. Uh, this is our closing uh, keynote conversation, uh, the last session of the day. And it's a very special session because we're joined by Dr. Joyce King. Um, and so I'm going to read a little bit about Joyce King for those of you that are, may not be familiar with her. Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk and then we'll have our little conversation here between the two of us. So Dr. Joyce King holds the Benjamin E. Mays Endowed Chair for Urban Teaching, Learning and Leadership at Georgia State University in the Department of Educational Policy Studies. She has served as Provost at Spelman College, Associate Provost at Medgar Evers College, Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Diversity at the University of New Orleans, Director of Teacher Education, Sarah Clara, Santa Clara University, and Head of the Ethnic Studies Department at Mills College. Dr. King has received several prestigious awards, including the W.K. Kellogg Foundation National Fellowship, and the American Council of Education, which she completed in the Office of the President at Stanford University. At Georgia State, she is affiliated faculty in the Department of African American Studies, the Women's and Gender Studies Institute, the Partnership for Urban Health Research, and the Urban Studies Institute. Her publications in the Harvard Ed Review, the Journal of Negro Education, International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, the Journal of African American History focus on a transformation, transformative role for culture and curriculum, urban teacher effectiveness, morally engaged community mediated inquiry, and black uh, and black education research and policy. She is an editorial board member for the urban uh, for the Urban Education Journal, co-edited the Review of Education Research, and author. Uh, or edited seven books, including her most recent, Heritage Knowledge in the Curriculum, Retrieving an African Episteme. Dr. King is also the past president of the American Educational Research Association, president of the board of directors of the Institute for Food and Development Policy, a member of the National African American Reparations Commission, and a recipient of the Stanford University School of Education Alumni Excellence Award. Um, like some others that we've seen today, I, her bio is, is, this is the brief bio, this is the short bio, this is the one that I could read in the 45 minutes that we have to be together today uh, because Dr. King is truly accomplished. Um, she's truly a blessing to the community of scholars that have access to her and that she works with each day. And I'm truly, truly honored uh, to have her here as our closing keynote for the Sources Conference and to have this opportunity uh, to have to be in conversation with her. Uh, Joyce King is a friend and she's a mentor um, and she's just a, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scholar. And so I'm, I'm really honored that you're here. Thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you. And thank you. Brian. Actually, my honor. Um, to be here. I was hearing a little echo. I guess that got taken care of. Um, well, congratulations to the CRIM Center for um, mounting this first ever virtual conference, which I understand has been so successful. I wasn't able to participate in uh, many of the sessions, but the ones that I did get in were quite um, exciting. And so again, sincere congratulations. Um, we're going to do this as a, uh, I got it inspired. And so I actually prepared a presentation and um, um, I worked really hard on it. And I hope that I don't um, go too long. If I do, I'll just stop talking because I'm sort of like my old professor that I always said I wouldn't be like, but here I am at this age um, uh, with the sort of um, profile. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'd like to alert the audience. Uh, this is a multimedia presentation and so I have some videos that may be a little wobbly, but I think you'll get the point and um, Dr. Salter is going to put some links in the chat. So if there's something that I show that you could follow up and look at later, you'll be able to do that too. 
So let me share my screen and um, get started. And I hope that this will allow us to have a really provocative conversation about um, what I am presenting. So, there it is. Okay, so here we go. Out the memory of our future, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, I always start presentations with this slide um, from which appeared in my computer about three or four years after Baba Asa made his transition. It just appeared in my computer. And so I take it as a message from the ancestors. And this is a scene from the Day of Judgment uh, in the uh, ancient Egyptian cosmology. And I just like to uh, emphasize that I'm talking about engaging youth with the visionary voices of our ancestors. Um, this is where at the end of our life, our heart is weighed to see if our heart is laid as a feather. And that's what we want. We want to be worthy of what our ancestors have um, done for us. Baba Asa always said, do not let them start our story with slavery. I did a lot of work on curriculum and that was the message that he gave me. And that's where I'm starting this presentation today. In a book on uh, Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original, the historian Robin D. Kelly wrote, more important than the memory of slavery was the memory of freedom. And that is the heritage knowledge that um, his family passed on to Thelonious Monk, who was a legendary, uncompromising jazz innovator extraordinaire. And I'll be talking about music, I'll be talking about popular culture, aspects of um, the environment that influences us. So history, memory, and identity is our human right to intentionally go back, vital knowledge from our collective past, to know who we are, to use this knowledge to conjure up and remember a radical Black future, a relevant Black personality, that is identity and the historical consciousness we need to understand and transform our everyday reality is our democratic birthright. I use Dr. John Henry Clark's teaching to define um, heritage knowledge and memory justice. Let me see if I can move this little, yeah, there we go. Memory justice, uh, Dr. Clark, was famous for his definition of heritage teaching, which permits African people to locate ourselves on the map of human geography. And while I'm using examples from the African-American experience, I would really encourage everyone to think about your own identity, your own background, and how what I'm saying might apply to you. people, you must first control what they think about themselves and how they regard their history and culture. And when your conqueror makes you ashamed of your culture and your history, he needs no prison, no prison walls and chains to hold you. So here's an example of alienation. A young person who uh, expresses identity confusion, and chosen self-exile. So this is part of the problem, part of the challenge that we find today in education and in our families. He said, uh, this was a young person who was bused across town to go to a white school. He said, I did not want to belong to the group of black kids I was forced to socialize with, 
what they were doing and how they were acting was obviously self-destructive. So I gravitated toward the white kids. I eventually learned that was not where I belonged either. It was then I became a loner. I couldn't, wouldn't in. I guess that's why I'm living out here outside of the U.S. myself in what I'm calling chosen self-exile. So heritage teaching or cultural education can end such a negative slide, can stop our ongoing psychic, cultural, spiritual, physical extermination and engage youth educators and community members in our history, values, and vision of our humanity. That is what I mean by the memory of our future. And I'm going to um, play uh, a section of a song that is on um, the album, The Majesty of the Blues by the celebrated jazz musician, Wynton Marcellus. This is a sermon that really addresses the way that black music, namely the blues and jazz, is disregarded in society, but what message does it have for us? And in this sermon, I think we can hear how we can connect lessons of the past with challenges we are facing now and in the future. So just bear with me, listen carefully, and um, then we'll go on with the rest of the, the slide presentation. Though we are told to mourn it, we must know was a noble sound. It had majesty. Yes, it was majestic. Deep down in the soul of the world, the notes themselves provide the level of revelation where the extent of great art. It formed a bridge. That's right, a bridge. A bridge that stretched from the realm of dreams to the highways and byways and thoroughfares and back roads of action. To be even more precise, let me say that this sound was itself an action. Like a knight wrapped in the glistening armor of invention, of creativity, of integrity, of grace, of sophistication, of soul. It arrived when the heart Possibly thriving community suffering the despair imposed by dragons. Now, if a dragon thinks it is grand enough, that dragon will try to make you believe that what you need to carry you through the inevitable turmoil that visits human life is beyond your grasp. If that dragon thinks it is grand enough, it will try to convince you that there is no escape, no release, no salvation from its wicked dominion. It will tell you that you are destined to live your life in the dark. But when a majestic sound takes the field, when it parts the walls of silence and noise with the power of song, oh, when this majestic concatenation of rhythm, harmony, and melody assembles itself in the invisible world of music, ears begin to change and lives begin to change and those who are musically lame begin to walk with a charismatic sophistication to their steps. You see, when, when something is pure, when it has the noblest reasons, this is fundamental purpose, then it will become a candle of sound in the dark cave of silence. Oh, yes. It was a noble sound. I say that Gather, we are told to mourn it, to know that it was a noble sound. It had majesty. Yes, it was majestic. Deep down in the soul of the whole, the notes themselves provide the level of revelation we can only expect of great art. It formed a bridge. That's right, a bridge. A bridge that stretched from the realm of dreams to the highways and byways and thoroughfares and back roads of action. To be even more precise, let me say that this sound was itself an action. 
action. Like a knight wrapped in the glistening armor of invention, of creativity, of integrity, of grace, of sophistication, of soul, the sound took to feel. It arrived when the heart was like a percussively throbbing community, suffering the despair imposed by dragons. Now, if a dragon thinks it is grand enough, that dragon will try to make you believe that what you need to carry you through the inevitable turmoil that visits human life is beyond your grasp. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Coming from the musicians of all hues and from all levels of training. Duke heard the constitutional orchestra of American life and transformed it into musical form. Whenever they said this music was dead, Duke was out there writing music and performing the meaning of his democratic birthright in an artistic language that uttered its first words way back on that first day when a slave sang a new song in this new and strange land. I am here to tell you that there are some who do not accept the premature autopsy of a noble art form. There are some of us out here who are on a quest and in the process of that quest to find ourselves having to perform conquests. There are some of us out here who believe that the majesty of human life demands an accurate rendition in rhythm. Duke performed with Sidney Bechet, with Louis Armstrong, with Alan Hawkins, with Charlie Parker, with John Coltrane, and wrote music for almost all of them. His own orchestra was described by Mahalia Jackson as a sacred institution. The Duke Ellington Orchestra was the manifestation of the elaborately fabricated drum that Duke called this music. He was dedicated without reservation. He knew that you have to listen to a noble sound. You see, you have to watch built on the intention of putting noble intonations into rhythm and tune. You have to beware for autopsies. A noble sound might not lie still in the dark cave where the dragons have taken. A noble sound might just rise up and push away the stones that were placed in its path. A noble sound might just rise up on the high side of the sky. It might just ring the silver bells of musical light that tear through the cloak of the dragon's shadow which blocked the sun. You got to watch those early autopsies. A noble sound is a mighty thing. It can mess around and end up swinging low and swinging high and flapping its wings in a rhythm that might swoop up over the limitations and pose by the green of the dragon. I said you better check those autopsies. Noble sound. Birthright understood so clearly by Duke Ellington. You just might swing low and it might tell you to get on board. It might move with so much grace and so much confidence that you will have to remember what I've been telling you. You had better not pay much attention to those premature autopsies. This noble sound, this thing of beauty, this art so barren but so ready for battle, it just might lift you high enough in the understanding of human life to let you know in no uncertain terms why that marvelous Washingtonian, Edward Kennedy Ellington, never, never came off the road. You might think of your own work and your struggle as a parallel to this noble sound, what is being discussed. And you might recognize that Reverend Jeremiah Wright was delivering that sermon. Now I wanna ask us to consider this question. While we are struggling to manifest our nobility of work and excellence, um, is it possible that diversity and inclusion might actually function as an eraser, erasure of our culture. I'm going to show you two short video clips. This one is an advertisement. Before Voltaire and arthritis came job, my husband would have been on the sidelines. But not anymore. I like the way. 
an alternative to pills. Voltaren is the first full prescription strength non steroidal anti inflammatory gel to target pain directly at the source. I actually need some of that pain medication, but that's not why I'm <laughs> showing it to you. When I lived in New Orleans, we used to say the white in New Orleans could really dance. Now, here's what um, the comedian Dave Chappelle has to say about that. You need, a, you need an eyes to save you from yourself. Remember when, when white people and black people couldn't be together? It was just white people alone in the club dancing. You ever see that old footage? How they look? You know what I'm talking about? You need some black eyes to look at you like. So the commercial is actually using a music from an earth, wind, and fire track. But that blackness appears in the commercial. For powerful earth. So, um, I, I have included in my presentation a number of references uh, that I hope that you'll follow up on. And this one is a new book that's just published by um, a radical black power attorney in, in Kichi Taifa. She, in her memoir, tells us what it takes to stay on the field struggle for a radical vision. Uh, she's just published, I'm gonna read a little bit from the article where she's writing about her book and also a new book by um, Alicia Garza uh, of Black Lives Matter. So what I want to say to black folks is remember, we are more than symbols on t-shirts. We have ideas for a new reality that need to be picked up. I would say we're more than uh, background music and commercials. Our ideas are decolonizing ideas, revolutionary and radical ideas. So decisions to use them will have to be made by those who are not afraid to lose friends and allies, especially when the latter provide positions, book contracts and television commentator deals. And I'm to you today from that same spirit. I hope I don't lose any friends, but I'm trying to speak some truth in this moment where we are. The memory of our future. And in, uh, in Kichi's book, she gives us a rundown of the Black Power Movement that is missing from our education. And that's what makes her book so important. Uh, in terms of the future, uh, we can say black people aren't automatically seen as making it to the future. And I'm quoting from another uh, source here, the um, Quantum Future Collective in Philadelphia. They say it's not normally a domain, the future is not normally a domain that was meant for us. But we've already made it into the future. We're already creating the future. We're already building the future. It's about Afrofuturism. It is a tool to help us think, create our old issues to ensure our existence, not our erasure, but our existence. There's people actually on the ground using Afrofuturism as a tool to work on issues and improve communities. And I'm going to give you examples. 14 year old Nigerian girls invented a urine powered generator. Young people are harnessing the power of people tech on the continent and in the diaspora. A boy here in Georgia who's a sophomore majoring in aerospace engineering at Chattahoochee Technical College. My question is, is he studying engineering from a people-centered perspective? connects the dots. 
enables us to ask questions like, what is a diaspora perspective on socialism, class versus race, COVID-19, and vaccines? Uh, what about the Afro-Latino Proud Boys leader who promotes multicultural white supremacy? And then we have the woke homeschooling conscious U.S. history curriculum, which you see on the other side of this slide. But it starts with slavery. And then there's the New York Times 1619. I have to look at very critically, even though we celebrate the gift that it has given us, because it starts with anti-Africanisms. And here's an example. The author seems to embrace what Melvin Herskovitz once called the myth of the Negro past. This idea was that the trauma of the Middle Passage and slavery was so overwhelming that they presented a clean break with the African continent. And so we have people today in our community saying, I ain't no African. The New York Times 1619 Project says, our speech and fashion and the drum of our music echoes Africa, but is not African. And that's what I mean by anti-African sentiments. So here's a little short trip through memory lane of my experience. And our task is to remember our collective past in order to heal the wounds of our miseducation. I grew up thinking the Egyptians, for example, look like Elizabeth Taylor. And then there was Aunt Jemima and she's being uh, upgraded today and even removed from some of the products. But we also have examples like this Remember the Time video, a uh, video that Michael Jackson produced. And Black Studies has given us a totally more truthful representation of the ancient Egyptians. And we talk about that as a victorious consciousness. In my own work, I'm using a girls' heritage club called the Songhai Princess Club. And we're looking at ways to engage young people with a hopeful vision for themselves. And these are two avatars uh, that are designed by a young man that I'm partnering with, Nicholas Hu, in his Daydreamer Academy. And these girls say, we are from the future. We are bringing back the forever free spirit of Aunt Jemima, not the stereotype of Aunt Jemima that was so embarrassing for us, but a different vision of Aunt Jemima which I've also researched and you see represented here in the uh, uh, art of Michael Ray Charles, a powerful woman, not the stereotype. How do we connect Black Panther, for example, and Beyonce's Black is King to Pan-African consciousness? That is our task. Well, teachers, we need you to teach heritage knowledge traditions, what I call diaspora literacy consciousness, the ways we resist and in New Orleans, they say, we don't bow down, we don't know how. So this is Big Chief Donald Harrison, who has made his transition, and his daughter, Big Queen Sharice, is carrying on that tradition. She's a teacher, and the suit that she's wearing is actually a text. If you know the symbols, you can actually read the suit that she's wearing. Uh, in an episode of Love craft country, if you saw that, they referred to Af African scripts. And I'm saying that we need to teach African language and culture to decode signs and symbols in our quilts and in cosmograms. And my students are reading Ishmael Reed's mumbo jumbo so that we can go back and decode some of those important cultural signs that he gave us. Uh, my former student, Dr. Ivanilda Amado, is back in Brazil. She worked with us for a year, and she is teaching Black liberation education in Bahia. And you can see that these young children are getting a good, strong dose of a healthy self-esteem and identity with their culture and heritage. So I'm speaking to you from the point of view of African epistemology, which says in the African worldview, knowledge is not merely a right, with knowledge comes responsibility to care for others and for the world. Knowledge in African epistemology is the path to becoming more fully human and humane. And I learned this from my teacher, St. Clair Drake, who was uh, a pioneering black socio social anthropology activist, one of only nine black anthropologists before World War II. 
when I studied with him at Stanford, he showed us the importance of being dedicated to liberation and he dedicated his scholarship, ethnographic studies of race, class and social structure to the eradication of social inequalities and racial justice. And he taught us that a black perspective is absolutely necessary. And as I said at the beginning, you can ask yourself what other perspectives are absolutely necessary to connect our past to the problems that we wanna to solve today and our future. And I'm going to end with an, a three minute animation that I produced about my own story, because I think we need to be able to reach people at all levels, not only those who read our scholarship, but young people, and so I think animation is very important. So here is my story. At Georgia State University, the American Educational Research Association's 2015 president, Dr. King's numerous publications, including Black Education, the landmark book she organized, document how researchers and schools that are failing Black students can reverse this injustice. Dr. King grew up in a working class black community in Stockton, California, surrounded by the life affirming sounds of gospel music and the blues. Her church members marched for their civil rights. She brought her spiritually fortifying cultural heritage along when she went to Stanford during the tumultuous 1960s. Though few in number, black students across the USA resisted inaccurate Eurocentric historical narratives and education for assimilation. While James Brown sang, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I'll get it myself. That's exactly what her generation did. King earned her doctorate in 1974, and the Black Studies Movement inspired her commitment to liberating education in the Black intellectual tradition. research and teaching in university and community settings, remember student culture and heritage knowledge, which curriculum bias erases. Teaching diaspora literacy consciousness using Sangoy, African language and history counters miseducation and anti-blackness, enabling students to see themselves in the world through their own cultural lens. Her concept of disconscious racism continues to impact research and teacher preparation for racial social justice. <laughs> Calling for an African Center Justice curriculum to rewrite knowledge across the academic disciplines for human freedom. Dr. King engages her graduate students other educators and community learning partners in the USA and internationally in transformative research and pedagogy for partisanship that challenges the existing educational system. So we're Okay, we can't hear you, Joyce. Okay, I think you're better now. Try it. Let's try it again. Okay, so okay. just to conclude, about engaging young people, educators, community members, and others, our co-conspirators, to use uh, the loves concept uh, in the values and our culture and history. That is the memory of our future that will help us solve the problems that we're encountering today and help us build a future that we do remember is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, thank you. So as usual, all day long, um, please, if you have questions, um, we're gonna go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Uh, but where I think, you know, Joyce, you and I can kind of start at while these are kind of rolling in, hold on one second, just so I can see 
because the chat is starting to <laughs> explode here. So we will we will uh, come back to the Q and A. So here's I'm I'm interested, Joyce, because for for me this entire conversation I've been waiting for this conversation um, because I think I've told you that there have been several occasions where I've had conversations with you, and then I can't sleep at night because I'm up thinking about what Joyce King challenged me to think about. And I'm hoping that that's, pro that's, that's what's happening here today is that you've got people thinking, but one of the things, our recent conversation, we had a recent conversation, you and I, that I think relates very well to this conversation and to also to, um, to the theme of, of the conference. And, you know, and so I, I think I came to you and I, I, I said that this COVID crisis um, that right now during this COVID crisis, we have children who are struggling to, to learn. We have teachers who are struggling to teach. We have children who are struggling just to get online so that they can learn. Our children are suffering um, from unmet mental health needs, emotional health needs, spiritual health needs. Uh, and so it's a tough time for our children right now. And my my guess is, and I think I said, you know, my guess is moving forward, when we get to August 2022, and the world has started maybe spinning correctly on its axis again, and we, we're back to something that feels like normal, that my anticipation, what I believe is probably going to happen, because I've been, I've seen public schools, I've been around public schools long enough, is that our public school system is going to say, all right, you were in sixth grade last year virtually, you're in seventh grade now, it's time to move forward, and they're going to put them pedal on the floor and they're going to move forward. And if you aren't ready, I'm sorry for you. I, I, Vincent Willis said, we're going to amputate a certain group of kids and just leave them behind. And I remember your answer to that was very challenging, right? Because your answer to that was, all right, so if we can envision that, if we are wise enough to be able to see that, then what can we begin to do now to stop that from happening? Um, and I think the other piece that you also mentioned is that, and we don't really need to begin to imagine and create new ideas because the answers are already in us. We've been here, we've done this work. Like we've, we've created schools with limited resources. We've started movements overnight. We know how to do this work. And, and it was eye-opening for me because I had to sit back and go, yeah, I guess you're absolutely right. I, I do know this. I know that we've done this work. But there's this gap, I feel, Joyce, for many of us that feel like, well, no, I don't have access. I haven't tapped into that. I'm unfamiliar with that. And so it does, in some ways, limit our ability to use that, that heritage knowledge and to put it into practice in, in terms of dealing with the problems that we have. And that's a gap that exists for our children. That's a gap that, gap that exists for adults. It's a gap that exists for our teachers. So I'm interested in your ideas on how do we begin to close that gap? I mean, that's an important gap to begin to close and to begin to address. Well, um, my daughter is a high school principal, an urban principal, and um, I'm one of her critical friends. So I hear uh, very often about the real deal that's happening um, with the children in the community that she serves. My students uh, here at Georgia State are on the front lines in, uh, with families and schools. My son is an emergency room doctor. So we could just flip this conversation over to the health crisis and talk about the gaps there. But um, I'm 73. Um, I remember things were created that didn't exist before. I've studied things that were created that didn't exist before. Social Security. The government decided to do that. When Social Security, they also allowed the Southern states to implement it the way that they wanted. And so we got left out again, out of Social Security. So an example that I sometimes use with my students, just in terms of the imaginary, 
and the force of our will. This was one of the things that Baba Asa always said. Do we have the will to educate black children? Um, Garvey, organized African descent all over the world. He didn't have a fax. He didn't have the internet. Okay. So we have so much more that our ancestors didn't have. When Du Bois was teaching at Atlanta University, and the so called race riot <clears throat> had taken place here in Atlanta in 1906, he was walking past where our College of Education building is. He's to the Atlanta, well, the Journal of Constitution newspaper, he was going to protest the role that the newspaper had played in fan games of that violence. And he passed by a butcher shop and he saw the knees of a black man who had been lynched the day before in the window with other meat. He writes about this. He said he turned around and went back in his office and got to work. So we are human the capacity to solve problems. And that's what we should do. I don't have the answer, but I do believe if we come together and decide in this place, what can we do for the communities, the teachers, the children, and we give some thought to that, we'll come up with some very innovative, ingenious um ways to solve those problems, just like those girls in Nigeria that invented the urine powered generator. These are the examples we need focusing on rather than being distracted by commercials that have us playing in the background, but disappearing us. Or lifting up the dragon that Jeremiah Wright talks about, right? And honoring that dragon as opposed to honoring the noble sound that exists within us. And what does the dragon do? Terrify you. You better be good, just like the Santa Claus. You, you know, you get no presents. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're terrified, you're immobilized. So we each have to look at ourselves and see what we can do. Everybody can't do the same thing. Everybody doesn't have to do what I do. But ask yourself, what can you do and what might be the obstacle that you have to overcome in your life to do that? And Cram Center sure, is sure. a wonderful place for people to come together and share and analyze and connect those dots. Yes. And that was my next question is this idea of community, right? So that identity piece is important. I think oftentimes we think about identity, we think about individual identity, but there's identity that exists in the community and this our communal identity. And I think you, once again, you sent me something just the other day that told the story of a group of children being asked to compete for food and deciding instead to work together and share the food and the idea of Ubuntu mm -hmm. as it exists. I am. Because we are and we are because I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about the value of that particular perspective in this work that we're moving forward in? Because I think in terms of values that we're often taught, the values that we're often taught are get ahead, do what you can for yourself, make, you know, take care of you and yours, um, competition. You know, these are the values that are often not only taught to us in the workplace, they're taught to us in schools. In 13 years of schooling, we're being taught these things. But we understand there's also value in doing things differently. And in, in terms of heritage knowledge, we think about it differently as well. Well, I encourage people to go to that sermon, um, the music on uh, Wynton Marcellus's album. I played just a little bit. It's about 20 minutes, I think, in total. Um, but the music as metaphor, and I, that's why I also put in the book um, that Robin D.G. Kelly wrote about Thelonious Monk. 
you you have a standard of excellence and creativity that is pushing against um the communal i am because we are expression of humanity this is human expression these are not people who are just trying to get rich this is i have something that i was born with and i want to express it but we're running up against a system that doesn't want that system wants you to sit down and be quiet and just go along to get along so if you have that fire if you have that spirit you can't do it by yourself. You need a collective. You need a partner. You need some people that you can check in with. How am I doing? That's what you and I do for each other. And I thank you for that. <laughs> absolutely. 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 I want to see if we have questions in the chat, uh, because I want to make sure that our, our, our participants have an opportunity to ask questions as well. And if not, I'll ask another. Okay, so how can we begin to address the damage that we as black educators have caused children of color due to the lack of knowledge and proper understanding of self? Well, it's not a, I mean, you can talk about it sort of intellectually in the abstract, but the how is to roll up your sleeves and get busy. Uh, you may be busy, so bring some other people in the circle of what you're doing so that you can get some other perspectives and look at your work with fresh eyes. I give my students um, the opportunity to do a class project instead of taking the final. Some of them are doing projects right now, but one of the requirements is that they have to have a community learning partner. So how do we undo how do we do things differently we have to broaden who's at the table and who's helping us look and we have to be able to talk about these challenges differently and see ourselves differently we're th th this is not rocket science if you go to any colonial setting where people have been colonized the same problem you have some folks who have signed on with the oppressor and others who are trying to say, but wait a minute, we had something going here that we ought to be able to, to bring back for our fullest human. So we're just in a human process as human beings and we can humbly admit that we make mistakes and that we have the capacity to do things differently together. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I'd add I, that at the end of the day, we're talking about harming children. I think this this harms us as educators oh, and teachers yeah. as well. There's a piece of us that's missing. There's a piece of us that's broken that needs to be healed as well. Um, I think that uh, you and I did some work in Brazil, my first opportunity to go to Brazil. And I remember saying to you that experiencing Black History Month as in Brazil, as, as Brazil was doing it at the time, versus what I'd experienced here in the United States, really helped me to think very differently about what it means to celebrate that part of our history. Right. Whereas in the United States, we might study icons, people, and in Brazil, they were talking about the strategy of the story of what resistance looked like. Mm -hmm. And teaching children the strategy of resistance prepares them to resist, prepares them to push back, prepares them to overcome. And that's very dis different than studying posters on a wall. When we were in Brazil, that was about 20 years, 20 years after my first time to go to Brazil. 20 something years ago, they didn't have everything that we saw when we were there. Mm -hmm. They were just beginning to um, approach education as a site of struggle. So, we remember we have to remind ourselves that these are historical processes and we have to look and see where are we in a historical process and we can, can look at someone else's experience and see how they're doing it and and learn from and that's why it's so important that we do have this broader perspective i agree i agree so joyce i we've got about five minutes left but we i wanted to make sure that we have time for the announcement of uh the Benjamin E. Mays Lecture. So every year um, we host a lecture as a part of, um, as in partnership with the Mays Chair, which is Dr. Joyce King. 
And so uh, last year it was Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. I think if you look in the AJC from yesterday, they are actually talking about the AJC about Dr. Linda Darling Hammond's uh, presentation here last year because she's also leading some of Joe Biden's work with regards to education now. But we want to announce, uh, and we do this every year at Sources, we want to announce the, the sec 32nd annual Benjamin E. Mays uh, speaker, Dr. Molefe Asante. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about Dr. Asante, uh, Joyce, and just let people kind of know what they're in for? Well, um, Dr. Asante is one of the founding scholars to um, advance the conversation and the theorizing about African-centered education or Afrocentricity. He is also a leading scholar in advancing Black studies as a discipline. Um, the concept that he uses now is Africa. Um, so I would encourage everyone to visit his website. He is the author of hundreds of books and articles. He's very prolific. Um, and I think we've moved that far away from the resistance that some people have been misdirected to Afrocentricity. So you have people saying, well, Afrocentricity is just Eurocentricity turned upside down. I think if you come and hear Dr. Asante, you'll get a very different understanding of the basis of being centered um, in scholarship and do come prepared having read some of what he's written. I agree, absolutely, absolutely. So the 32nd annual Benjamin E. Mays lecture will happen on February 25th, 2021. It will be a virtual lecture this year uh, because we're anticipating that we'll still be attempting to uh, to deal with this, this coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so we wanna keep people safe, but like similar to uh, the Sources Conference, we're not gonna let this stop us from doing the good work. And so we will have our Mays lecture this year and our Benjamin Mays chair will be there, Dr. Joyce King once again, to lead the Q&A with Dr. Asante. So uh, thank you, Joyce. Thank you for thank all you, of the work that you do. Thank yeah. you very thank much, you. because when you said Dr. Asante, I said, really? And I raised my eyes and I was like, are you sure you, you sure you want to go that way? And you said, yes. I said, yeah. okay, I'm with yeah. you. <laughs> we're ready. We're ready. We're, hey, hey, look, if we're not, we, we're going we're gonna to be. We're going to be. We're definitely going to be. So, Joyce, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for closing our this year's our Sources Conference uh, with this conversation. I'm hoping that people are taking from you this idea of actually that it is in us already. It's there, the ideas that we need, the solutions that we need, the strategies that we need, they exist within us already or they exist within our history. And, and if we can family. just figure out a way to apply them. Say it again. I said they exist in our families. And I think we yeah. each can gain a lot by checking in with the elders in our own families to see how they manage to overcome difficulties and help. That's when we talk about the ancestors. How did our family help us get to this place? And therefore, what is our obligation? And overcome, absolutely. Thank you, Joyce, thank you. And thank you to all of the participants in the 15th Annual Source of Urban Educational Excellence Conference. Um, as I understand it, uh, you know, there will be a bit of an after gathering party, whatever we can do uh, on Zoom. If you want to just hang out with us and get to know other people that are a part of this amazing community, Dr. Krim's community of believers, uh, we love to have you to hang out with us for a little while. But if you can't, we are happy that you spent some time with us today. Thank you so much for being a part of this amazing conference, the first ever virtual Sources of Urban Educational Excellence Conference. And we will see you at the Mays Lecture. Please share with others. Let them know what's coming up in February. Let them know what you experienced here today. Get to know our authors and our presenters and the work that they're doing. Connect with each other. We've got lots of work to do, but we need to do it together. We need to do it together. We'll see you next year.